Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome many to the chambers this evening and also welcome those who are checking in electronically. Uh, I'd like to call the uh, Standing Committee to order, the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee. Today, we acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. We are thankful to share in the special spirit of this place, rich in the energy of Mother Earth, our ancestors, and the love of all creation. Uh, first up is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, we have had an amendment. Uh, the 10-minute uh, deputation that was booked has been deferred to March. So could I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the agenda with that change? Uh, Councillor Doherty, Councillor Hamlin, all those in favour? That is carried. Thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest this evening? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a conflict on item 6.4. Um, it's, I think, somewhere between a pecuniary interest. I acted on the transaction in which the proponent of the applicant purchased the lands. I'm no longer practicing law, but uh, I think um, uh, between the conflict of interest and the code of conduct, I should remove myself from that item. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Anderson. Okay. Any others? Seeing none, then uh, we um, will move on to business arising from the previous meeting. Or anything? Okay. And we have no deputations, so then we move into staff reports. Uh, first up is PW 2019-05, our 2018 annual water compliance report. And uh, Director McDonald has been introduced. I know it'll be Manager Slama that's going to do the report here. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Manager Slama, and she will uh, go through the report uh, and uh, perhaps highlight uh, the report as well as uh, uh, some of the uh, duties and responsibilities uh, we go through with the Water Department and kind of in conjunction with the recent training Council had. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just before I begin, I'd just like to point out I do have um, our compliance officer, Marie Richardson, is is in the audience here this evening. So um, I'll I'll speak to the to the report and and some other aspects as uh, the director mentioned. And if there's questions after that, uh, myself or Marie can answer them. So presenting the annual uh, the annual compliance report is a requirement under the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act. The annual report must cover the previous uh, years of operation and it must be um, posted on the town's website by February 28th. By coming to this committee meeting, we're looking to um, have the report uh, you know, go through the process of committee and council approval and then posted on the website by February 28th. Uh, we're happy to report that in 2018 there were zero incidences of adverse drinking water tests. Uh, we had our Ministry of the Environment, Climate Change and Parks inspection in November of 2018 and uh, following this inspection Collingwood's water system received a 100% uh, rating. Uh, we are required under the Safe Drinking Water Act to complete um, quite a bit of testing. And so um, we uh, complete typically more than our minimum, what, what we need to do. We're making sure we exceed, we're exceeding that. Uh, so all of our microbiological tests were free of E. coli and total coliforms. And all of the chemical testings of organic, inorganic, and aesthetic parameters were within the required limits. So that's kind of like the, the nutshell of the, of the big message that um, we, we want to um, give with the compliance report. Uh, as the director mentioned, uh, council received their standard of care training uh, last week and so we thought uh, it was a good time to, uh, that was a good opportunity for councils to learn of their responsibilities under the Safe Drinking Water Act and we thought this was a good opportunity for us to talk about some of the key elements that were pointed out through that training and how they comply specifically to our Collingwood system. So under the standard of care, uh, they kind of, it covers uh, five elements or barriers. 
When we look at source water protection, this is to keep our raw water as clean as possible in order to lower the risk of hazards that could be present. Uh, under treatment, we look to remove and or neutralize all hazards. Maintenance of the integrity of the distribution system to prevent recontamination after treatment and monitoring programs to detect and act on system problems that could impair drinking water safety and also to verify the performance of the system components and the finished drinking water quality. Effective management systems include automated control systems, uh, well-developed responses and operating practices that are the ultimate means for protecting the safety of the drinking water systems. So I'll speak to each of these as they pertain to Colony for a bit. So Collingwood is included in the South Georgian Bay Lake Simcoe Source uh, Protection Plan. This uh, plan protects Nottawasaga Bay, and the bay provides a very good uh, quality source water for us here at Collingwood and others that use it. And the source water protection plan helps to protect that this level of quality is maintained. For treatment, uh, at Collingwood, our multi-barrier approach is, uh, filtrate, is ultrafiltration and chlorination. Our level of filtration as ultrafiltration is one that removes mo most pathogens and viruses. Uh, chlorine remains in the distribution system to provide some residual protection. Uh, this redundancy, some of the, this provides a bit of redundancy, but also we have redundancy with backup chlorination plans, multiple filter trains, backup pumps, and, and that's where we have some redundancy in, in our own system. For the distribution system under distribution and storage, we have one water tower, two reservoirs, and two booster stations. Our proposed Stewart Road um, reservoir and booster station will um, add another facility to service phase uh, zone two, pressure zone two. So three of these locations include, uh, other reservoirs include booster, chlorine, and are monitored continuously for the chlorine levels. Mains are kept in good repair. We do annual leak detection. We uh, work to repair water main leaks as quickly as possible. And we have a flushing program that uh, we do twice a year. In addition to the continuous monitoring that we have at the treatment plant, we also take weekly bacteriological samples in the treatment at the treatment plant and distribution system and quarterly chemical sampling. All of these meet the requirements of the regulation. Some of the factors that go into uh, having a robust water system include these components of management and for in the drinking water world, we do have a quality management system that meets the drinking water quality management system, uh, which is regulated. This is audited internally and externally every year. The QMS includes minimum, minimum competency requirements for operators and managers. Operators all fall under the licensing program. In order to keep their licenses, they require 105 hours of training every three years, and at least 36 of those hours must be ministry-approved training courses. Succession planning is part of the personal <coughs> coverage requirement. While this is a problem for many municipalities, in Collingwood, our employees cover a range of ages, making mass retirement not an issue at the current time. I will note that we have had a few senior people leave, so we, um, you know, we have more confidence in our succession planning in the last couple of years because we have had a couple of senior people leave key positions, and and we've uh, hired in, in um, some new employees to those positions. In spite of the best laid plans, emergencies can happen. Our emergency plan identifies possible emergency situations such as equipment failure and extreme weather events, and lays out a plan for recovery and mitigation. A section of the plan is tested each year. Last December, the Water Department used the scenario of a cyber attack on a SCADA computer as a basis for a test of the emergency plan. We worked through a plan to keep the system running in compliance while the SCADA, SCADA computer was out of service. Recently, the SCADA server was upgraded and the upgrade provides even more protection for a potential threat. 
So the QMS policy represents the guiding principles of the quality management system. And, and these are the um, components of our policy. Maintaining and continually, continually improving our quality management system. And this is achieved through our annual management review. Providing a safe, reliable supply of potable drinking water to our customers. Meeting or exceeding all applicable legislation, regulation, and other requirements. Communicating openly and effectively with employees, council, and the public. And providing services in an environmentally responsible manner. This policy is reviewed annually and through the management review process, which includes the director, the manager of environmental services, and the compliance officer. And it is signed by the CAO and the mayor and displayed at our operations center and at the water treatment plant. So that concludes uh, some of the, what I was going to touch on this evening. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Manager Slama. First, before I ask the public, there's anybody who wishes to comment on uh, this report, I would extend congratulations on behalf of the committee on exemplary results and um, to you, uh, to Director McDonald and the entire team, because we know you do go above and beyond, and this is a great result that you surely uh, deserve. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to such a terrific report? <laughs> Seeing none, then I will put the recommendation on the table, and that is that Council receive Staff Report PW 2019-05 and approve the 2018 Annual Water Compliance Report. A mover and a seconder, please. Mayor Saunderson, uh, Deputy Mayor Ho. Any questions from Council or comments? Yeah, Mayor Saunderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to um, Peggy. Um, I'm just looking at the backflow prevention program, and I know we've implemented that fairly recently, and we've indicated that we are have 183 compliant premises and 313 that have been through the initial survey. There are a total of about 650. Do we have a timeline for the completion of that accreditation process? Yes, through the through the chair, um, we're still expecting um, three years minimum to kind of to hit uh, all of the <coughs> businesses, uh, at least for the first touch. And I think it um, it does take time for. Um, the businesses to go through the process as well. So it, it can take easily nine months or a year. So, you know, three three years to, to touch them all and hopefully four years where um, we have everybody in the system and, and working on compliance within it. Good. Thank you very much and congratulations. Okay. All right, so seeing no further questions, all those in favor of the recommendation, and that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Our next staff report, PW 2019-06, is regarding a stop sign at the intersection of Cedar Street um, with 2nd and 3rd Streets. And I'll ask uh, Director McDonald, so I know you gave us a lot of background material, but if you could give us the uh, overview, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Over the uh, past five years, we've been uh, monitoring and evaluating uh, uh, the uh, intersections of both 2nd and Cedar and 3rd and Cedar. Um, this evaluation is based on the town approved policy as well as uh, the Ontario traffic manual. Previous uh, years evaluations, uh, if you could just to the next one, previous years evaluations um, um, did not warrant uh, a stop at, at these locations. However, uh, we conducted a, a survey and an evaluation in November of 2018 and found that the intersection of Second and Cedar warranted for an all-way stop at that location. The one at uh, 3rd and Cedar does not warrant a stop, at uh, all-way stop at that location. And the analysis is based on uh, uh, collision history as well as uh, traffic volume warrants. And the, uh, the goal of uh, an all-way stop is you try to have um, uh, uh, equal or near equal uh, traffic and minimum traffic volumes. Uh, the idea of an always stop is not to uh, control speed or other means, it's to control traffic and an always stop is ideal for an intersection where you have relatively equal traffic volumes. And as such, uh, uh, we're recommending that we uh, install an always stop at 2nd uh, 
and cedar. Thank you very much. Is there anyone uh, from the public who wishes to address this? Uh, can I have a show of hands of total? How many would like to speak? All right, so the lady first. Me? Yes, please. Come forward. Do we have a sheet? So um, there is a sheet for you to sign, and if you could introduce okay. yourself for us as well. And can I sign this after? Yeah, you can sign it after. Yeah, that'd be great. And introduce yourself. You have five minutes, and we will give you a 30-second warning. Um, my name's Kate. I live at Cedar and Third. Um, I came here with relatively short notice, so I have wrote a few notes, if you'll bear with me. Um, I'm happy to see a recommendation for a stop sign at Second and Cedar. I know that's a very busy intersection. Um, but the neighbors and I at Third have had some concerns for some time, and I've called the city, I mean the town, a few times about it. Um, let me see what I said here. I'd like to raise a few points in favor of a stop sign at Third and Cedar. Um, notwithstanding the fact that Third Street is classified as a major or collector road, which I was surprised to learn, um, it is no different in its physical characteristics from any of the other streets around town. Um, meaning the same speed limit, same sidewalks, or lack of, and width of the roadway. Um, and I was surprised to see, too, with the traffic report, that Third Street is not even functioning the same as Second, meaning that uh, their volumes are lower than Second, surprisingly. Um, so why does Third Street have a higher classification? Um, that I would argue that the traffic count was done in August 2018, which is not a typical high time of year, that perhaps a, the town council should recommend that they do it during the school season and maybe during pick up or drop off time. Um, and they said, recorded only one accident in the last two years at that intersection. I would say that my neighbors and I would attest that there would be more than just one. And I know there are certain qualifications that the accident has to uh, meet but I would say that there are probably a number of accidents that go unreported at that intersection. Um, that Mountain View Public School is only five blocks west of this intersection, and there are only two opportunities for students to cross the street safely at a four-way before they reach Spruce. There actually isn't a sidewalk on the north side of Third between Cedar and Spruce, forcing students to cross at that location. Um, and the volume of traffic makes it unsafe to do so. I've watched students wait up to 10 minutes to cross, and I know a lot of parents walk with their children specifically to cross there. Um, there's a bus stop actually at that location as well. So when the bus stops to pick up people, as it does quite periodically, and more so more, thank you, um, people pass impatiently the bus, and it creates a dangerous intersection, meaning people can't see past the bus, pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers alike. And then some people who are just impatient to wait, zoom into oncoming traffic to pass. And I know myself, I've seen a couple of near, near misses with children walking, mainly. Um, and there's a mailbox at Cedar and Third, so there are a lot of cars blocking visibility and traffic there periodically throughout the day. Um, I'd just like that you would uh, consider those things as well, even though I know with an outdated official plan, they do classify it as a higher, as a collector of road or as a major artery, but I, I would say that maybe that isn't relevant anymore. Um, I don't know if there's an amendment that might be happening to official plan in regards to that. I don't know when it was classified that way, but I would say that the neighborhood functions more as a pedestrian friendly, um, where we're encouraging our children to be independent, where we have elderly people walking, and then maybe we should consider safety over top of that. And that's it. Thank you very much for your comments. Do you have a response, Director McDonald? I know you've taken the notes. Uh, certainly, there was a lot of information. Hopefully, I've captured it all. Uh, certainly, the accident, uh, the accident uh, information we got from provincial, from the provincial police. So it's mm -hmm. their records. It's not our records. So uh, it's the information that we were provided by them. The um, the. Information with respect to the classification of the road that has been in place for a very long time and uh, it is consistent with Ontario Street as a collector road and the idea of it providing um, um, a more direct route for traffic to get to the downtown core 
And in, in addition, there's a planned uh, light for the third and high, as well as a connection um, through to Cambridge Street when that development proceeds. So the goal is for Third Street to be a collector road. It's always been that way, and uh, we're moving forward like with our um, construction plans. At this time, the road is not configured. It's configured similar to the rest of them, but uh, certainly if you look at third, uh, closer to the downtown core, it's wider, it's similar to Ontario Street, and ultimately at some point in time it will be a, a wider road with bike lanes, etc., similar to Ontario Street. Is it possible that priorities in the neighborhood might have changed since that official plan classification of the street? Uh, certainly, the, in terms of the, uh, the classification in, in, the, in the particular neighborhood, if you look at your overall traffic patterns uh, in terms of of movements for the overall traffic beyond just the neighborhood, the uh, traffic patterns, as I said, from from uh, a proposed development at Cambridge High Street, and that development will bring traffic down uh, down Third Street as well as Ontario. Is there a consideration for the fact that there are so many public amenities on Third Street, um, including Centennial Pool, the school itself, the skate park, the ball diamonds? Is it perhaps maybe not the best location to have such dense traffic in the future being directed down there? Uh, through the chair, um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, location of, uh, of um, a collector road in those type of amenities on a collector road is similar to Hume Street and others where you, um, the idea is you, you encourage traffic to be on those streets because there are direct access to that type of amenity. Okay, thank you very much for asking those questions, and I, I think that you should not hesitate to um, maybe contact offline with uh, Director McDonald on if you need to, f to finish those concerns or uh, have a further discussion, but okay. he will certainly take that under advisement and understands where you're coming from for sure. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for thank coming. You. Okay. Matt? Um, I live over in the east end of town, and traffic calming should be at the top list of the town's budget this year with regards to sidewalk improvement, sidewalk connections to bus stations or bus, uh, you know, bus uh, pickup sites. I think second and in, in, uh, second street and Cedar. That's a a good improvement because a lot of people come off of first and you know you're coming off a, a faster road to a, a quieter road um, I think intensification downtown is happening and I agree with this lady here like why would there be a count in August when more traffic's in the ski season and school season I would recommend a recount and like she said, there's a mailbox in the way and a bus stop in the way, and it's competing for uh, traffic control. I would have to say there should be four ways at both, and there should be a recount. So I would recommend council do a recount. As we know, August is generally a quiet time in town, probably the only month that's quiet. I would recommend a recount. and. Uh, I think we need to intensify four-way stops, for example. So I recommend a recount, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. Matthew, thank you for your comments. Um, I'll let Director McDonald add if he needs to, but I think he's been clear on the legislative process. But I think he also um, was very clear that they recognized that they followed up after the first count to follow up on it. So there will be continued follow up on the intersections. As I, I like what this lady said in person. She's observed in traffic at the right time, school children crossing a bus stop, and people shouldn't be passing the bus anyways. That's absolutely mental. But seeing, seeing it in the works, I think we need more people like this who are actually parents to come up here and reinforce the fact that numbers lie. That's a fact. <laughs> well, okay? absolutely it's important that people come and engage and give us the information for our decision exactly. making. I agree. Exactly. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to speak to this? 
seeing none, uh, the recommendation is that, um, uh, that the Development Operations Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following recommendation to the next meeting of Council, uh, that Council approve the addition of stop signs for the purpose of providing all-way stop control at the intersection of 2nd Street and Cedar Street, and further that a bylaw be prepared for approval to enact the stop control condition and all-way stop control condition as recommended and staff be directed to erect the appropriate signage. We have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Doherty, Mayor Saunderson, questions? Um, through you to uh, the director, uh, two points of clarification, I guess. One is, uh, if uh, Third Street's identified and will be continued to use, be used as a collector, um, what's the standard practice or policy as it relates to sidewalks uh, or the lack thereof as noted in the presentation on the north side? And the second is a point of interest, I, I don't know the answer to this, but does a lower tier municipality have any control as it relates to um, the regulating whether or not a, um, a person can actually pass a municipal transit vehicle when it's when it's parked, or is that strictly up to uh, upper tier level government? Thank you, Director McDonald. Uh, through the chair. Uh, on, on, the, uh, on the second one, uh, that's the Highway Traffic Act in terms of uh, uh, overcoming a, a stop bus. Uh, so it's, um, it's not a, a local jurisdiction, it would be a, a, an OPP or a police issue, uh, but they would have to be there at the time and uh, it's difficult to follow the bus around. So if that's a, at, the local, uh, at the local level. And uh, sorry, forgive me on the second question or the first question was, Oh, the sidewalks, yes, sorry, my apologies. Um, typically a collector road, uh, it is intended to have sidewalks on both sides of the road. So it just as a follow-up specific to that, I, I wasn't aware, so it's just being raised for the first time. Uh, has that stretch been identified as a missing sidewalk and is there a plan as it relates to either this year or a future budget to implement an additional sidewalk? Certainly, that uh, that road from uh, uh, I guess where the curb stops. I think it's Maple. It may be Beach. Uh, is the full width collector style sidewalk on both sides, and ultimately that uh, standard will be brought all the way to High Street. But it's not identified in terms of our immediate budget needs, uh, and we would not put the sidewalk in in advance of the road construction. So we would work it through as a, a complete project. Thank you. And that just as a follow-up to Deputy Mayor Hall's question, then would an awareness campaign of some be um, beneficial for us in terms of not passing the uh, transit buses? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there are signs at the back on the back of transit buses that that uh, remind the uh, drivers that they're not to overcome a bus. There are provincial signs that. Uh, that are on all buses. Uh, we certainly can uh, include uh, a, a reminder or a, a form of campaign to make people aware of that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mayor Saunderson, sorry. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, through you to Brian. I, I can appreciate certainly that these kind of formulistic for, um, assessments of whether or not a stop sign is, uh, is required, whether it be on one road or another, can be confusing, but I, my take um, away from the information and comments from um, members of the gallery is that uh, we need to look at traffic calming uh, mechanisms. And I know in the appendix of the policy, it talks about speed control devices. I know we have a number of those solar panel uh, speed control that will reflect when someone's going too fast. I'm wondering uh, how many we have and if we can look at a uh, program of rotating them around town, particularly in the areas of schools, to keep people mindful of how fast they're going when they're driving in those areas. Uh, through the chair, we have four of those devices and we do rotate them through. Second and Third Street is on our list, so if we can include them. Uh, unfortunately, we get around to those roads maybe once a year. And it's only during the summer months. It's difficult uh, from a staffing perspective, but also from a uh, operations perspective, if you're putting the signs up in the winter time. 
And so it's during the non-winter months that we put those signs up. I wonder, particularly in reference to the school areas, if it's possible to do it while the schools are in session so that people understand, you know, when the kids are there, that they're just how fast they are going? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Dorsey? Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, through you also to Director McDonald. Um, from time to time, we do have uh, comments and, and complaints about volume of traffic, particularly during the school day at certain intersections. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hall, or Hall uh, referenced um, periodic uh, traffic backups on Lockhart uh, at uh, here Ontario Street, and I had um, spoken to you about um, the periodic backups on Finley. What, how Councilor, is a count? Sorry, Councillor Dory, if it's not specific to the second street uh, okay, sorry. intersection, yeah. can you ask that under other business? Certainly. Yes. I, I think we need to deal with this. It'll, it'll come, it would come around, but I can certainly wait until. Oh, okay. No, if you're coming around in a second, that's fine. Coming around to the question of how do we trigger a count? How do we initiate a count? Certainly on, on these particular cases with the always stops, the process that we have adopted, the council's policy is that uh, it's upon uh, um, complaint or inquiry. Uh, but there are other intersections that we uh, have included as part of our um, transportation network. Uh, you mentioned Lockhart and Hume. That is a, a signalized intersection that we do monitor on, our, on a regular basis. So uh, it's a combination of both. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Oh, Councillor Hamlin. Uh, so what I have really is a comment. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I was very sympathetic to uh, the presentation made here this evening, um, and also very sympathetic to the concerns, I guess, that uh, Director McDonald's raised. Uh, and it seems to me what we have in third, and we all know third because we all spend you know our days driving up and down, and I'm sure, is that we have a road that in essence functions as a local road. It's physically characteristics are local roads, so we heard. Um, and we can't expect any widening or sidewalks until it's included in some future budget. Um, I see from the traffic counts, and I think our deputy raised this, that even in August there were more cars on 2nd and Cedar at that intersection than there were at 3rd and Cedar. So in fact, 2nd's operating uh, at a higher capacity in terms of cars. So, you know, I, I really think that Third and Cedar is, is functioning more as a local road at the current time. I, I would like to, um, and I guess the other thing that really uh, resonated with me is the fact that the, side, the kids coming uh, from, the, I'll say, the north side of Third to get to the school have to cross Third. And, you know, the sidewalk ends at Cedar and there's no way to pause the traffic. Cedar and Third, and there's buses and a mailbox and people speeding and you know we all know. So what I would like to suggest is that, uh, and it seems to me that the counts were just shy. If we were to treat Third uh, and Cedar as a local road, um, we would need a minimum of 350 cars in terms of the volume, and we're at 331 in the August count, so not very far off. So I'd like to rec uh, see if I could, I don't know if I have to make an amendment, but to uh, ask staff to have a, another uh, count conducted um, at that intersection, and I, I think that was a good idea at either a drop-off or pick-up time for the school uh, during the week when the school's in. Let's see how many cars are actually there. And uh, I would like to review this again after that time. I, I am speaking, of course, in support of a four-way stop as recommended at Second and Cedar. Okay, thank you. Um, Director McDonald, would that happen in, in due course in any event? Or do we need an amendment uh, to request that? Certainly, we, we have been monitoring these intersections and we will continue to monitor them and we will uh, take uh, 
those suggestions in terms of the timing of the monitor of the uh, monitoring and, and move forward with that. Is that okay, Councilor Hammond? Uh, well, I would like a timeline uh, attached to that and a report to come back. Uh, yeah, we'll need an amendment then because you're directing staff. So if you could word the amendment, please. Okay. Um, so uh, to request uh, to you know accept the current obviously current recommendation, but in addition to request that staff uh, have a further uh, traffic uh, count done during the school day uh, pick up or drop off time uh, within the next six months and that a report back come back to council on the outcome of that traffic study. Is there a secondary for the amendment? Deputy Mayor Hall. Comment directing the dollar those timelines reasonable. Okay. All right. On the amendment. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment? That is carried unanimously. Then we will go to the motion as amended. All those in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Okay. Thank you very much. Next, we have 6.3 uh, P 201909, the uh, proposed radio communication tower by Shared Network Canada at 153 11th line. And I'll have uh, Director Farrow present, please. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a uh, request for a new communications tower uh, on the 11th line. Uh, we do have a, a air photo up that shows where the tower is going to go and uh, also a site plan showing um, the property. Uh, this is a situation where the town is not the approval authority, but what we are is we are expected to provide comments uh, to Industry Canada, who are the approval authority. Um, so they do ask local municipalities for their comments in these um, situations. Uh, it, we have had a public open house. Um, we have also uh, had a number of comments from the public. Uh, those are attached to the report. And um, certainly it is a, there's no question it's a, it's a tall tower. Um, I don't, I'm not suggesting, uh, Madam Chair, that these things are our favorites, but they seem to be part of our daily life and something that uh, we do need to have throughout our community at this point in time. So, Madam Chair, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. And also, uh, the applicant is, I believe, in the audience, and she would be also available to answer any questions. All right, terrific. Is uh, Could I have a show of hands of how many people would like to speak to this uh, agenda item? Okay, so maybe, is it Tracy? It's okay. Tracy, maybe if you want to come forward and... Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and community members. My name is Tracy Pilon Abs. I'm a professional planner in the province of Ontario, and I represent Shared Network Canada, who is building the facility. Excuse and me, may I ask that you speak in the uh, microphone? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm no. not hearing. Oh, okay, thank you. Said. Thank you. Is this a little bit better? Yeah, it's kind of, you have to kind of. And I apologize, I do have a cold as well, so yeah. that's not helping at all. I'll make sure I come in really close. Um, so I represent Shared Network Canada who is building the tower. It's a 60 meter self-support tower at 153 11th line. Um, under Industry Canada, public consultation is required. Comments were received at the public open house and reviewed by Shared Network Canada. There were no technical issues uh, that were presented that uh, affected the location, the height, or the design of the proposed structure. So Shared Network Canada wishes to proceed as submitted. Uh, the request for concurrence is what re is required by Council, and we need to have Council confirm that we have followed the Municipal Protocol and the Industry Canada's Protocol, and this supports your recommendation from staff. And I'd be happy to answer any particular questions you might have with this regard. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Uh, what we're gonna do is hear from the public first and we'll work our way through questions and then we'll put the recommendation on the table and then we'll have council's questions. So it's a bit of a 
process we go through. So we'll I'll continue with some of the public comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're the winner. Come on down. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the council. I'm uh, David Matthews. I'm the resident on the 63 Kells Crescent, which some of you probably know or remember. Um, I, I'm going to be very brief because one of our neighbors, um, John Ranella, did quite a bit of investigation and I think submitted a report to you. And, you know, initially, the, the part that really sticks to me is that uh, in that finding, it says residentially designated areas do not even meet the list of acceptable options. And this area is clearly residential. There's going to be supposedly somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand units just to the east of the tower. There's going to be another 350 on the south side of Mountain Road and at 10th. Um, there's proposals to be on the west side of, of the 11th line. So ultimately, it's going to be a very high residential area. And I think um, whilst we all get glued to our phones on our hip, uh, there should be another location, in my opinion, that not smack in the middle of a proposed residential area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If you could just sign the sheet, yeah. David, please. Thank you. And I know I saw a third hand. No one else? My name is Marika Hanich, and I live at the end of that road. Um, the location, the proposed location of the tower is exactly 400 meters from our home. Um, we attended the public meeting that uh, Tracy uh, Abs had in town and we voiced our concerns and of course we had a response. My, I am concerned with property values, first of all. Actually, that's not my first concern, but property values, um, I don't think that's been addressed. I've spoken to a couple of real estate agents and they definitely say property values are diminished in the presence of a tower. Um, my greatest concern is health. And I'm going to start, I'm going to try to keep this simple. I've done quite a bit of research on um, ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Um, this is from Dr. Neil Cherry, PhD. He's a biophysicist in New Zealand. And um, he states that there is no safe level of EMR. He wrote a 120-page review of 188 scientific studies that were done internationally, and he concluded that EMRs, electromagnetic radiation, causes cells to change in a way that makes them cancer-forming. Um, I know in California, they don't allow cell phone towers anywhere near a hospital or a school. And as we know, they are always on the leading edge of um, those kinds of safety, environmental and, and health concerns. Um, I wasn't prepared to make a speech, but I just wanted to make a couple of points. Um, just in case you're interested, effects of low-level radiation. And I know we're surrounded by them. I mean, our TVs give it off, our cell phones give it off. We are surrounded. We're so surrounded by uh, electromagnetic radiation that we just take it for granted and think it's fine. It's okay. It's okay. But people that live in the vicinity of, um, of towers emitting low levels of radiation complain of headache, sleep disorders, memory impairment, nosebleeds, increase in, she in seizures and heart rates, lower sperm counts, 
impaired nervous systems and the blood-brain barrier is impaired, it, it, it leaks. So um, there's much more, but I think I'll stop there. And I, I stated my concerns in our public meeting and I have had no response. No one has addressed these concerns and I think it's because we just ignore it and think there is uh, nothing to it. But um, I, I feel that's wrong. And I feel that um, we should, I, I don't know if anybody in this chamber has even considered uh, the health effects of a tower on a community in the vicinity of the tower. Anyway, I leave that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I had one, I had one other question. Um, the, in one of the um, communications that we got from Shared Network, there's a, there's a map at the back that shows the property fronts on the 11th line and continues right through to the 10th line. I don't know if anybody, Tracy, do you know if that's accurate? Is that one, one piece of property? Does anybody know that or is it several chunks in there? Because, um, as I say, it's, it's shown as one piece. And my husband uh, created a map and suggested the tower be located on that same property elsewhere, away from most of the residences and in the commercial area. And it fronts on 10th and on 11th. So access, if this map is accurate, access could be from the 10th line, which is the commercial area where there will never be any homes. Okay, thank you. And anyway, so I, I, I would like that question answered, please. And um, what consideration has been given to health effects? Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Ms. Nish, for uh, coming to comment. And um, I think once we collect all the questions, we'll have uh, staff who have some comments to reply to you. Um, we'll do it all at once together. Matthew? Yes, it's uh, Matthew, pretty East End resident. I've been doing some research with um, radio waves. And what I've learned is that anything living near a tower grows smaller. It, it stops the growth from being as... Uh, as normal, it, it's, it slows the growth of uh, plants. As well, electromagnetic radiation interferes with the natural uh, biology of humans by intensifying stressors in the body. I cannot get over the mental behavior of people with sitting and on their phones, 5G, 4G, it's so powerful, it'll give you heart arrhythmia. I don't even carry a mobile telephone anymore because I know from past use of it, it created almost like a like a, a stress in my body. Like it was just amazing what it did to me. And uh, that erratic behavior will decrease your focus thus impact your immunity. They're very, very sophisticated pieces of technology. I would recommend any tower be built on a commercial structure, just like the elevator at the water or the water tower is relatively isolated. But I do know the powers of this electromagnetic radiation and radio waves, and it's super powerful. Like it's it can cause great damage to a body over time, especially using these radio receivers in your hand. Like, you should turn them off, Matthew, put them on airplane mode. It's bad, Councillor Jeffrey. No, I understand. It's but very, we just need, very bad. Our conversation needs to go specifically. Move it to a commercial so. zone, like this lady said. They want to sell the properties around that area. Okay. That tower will be there forever. You know, look at what's going on in the news. And I'll tell you, it is dangerous stuff. It reduces the growth of, of biological life. It creates a stress frequency that is 
beyond most people's understanding. To be carrying these devices in hand is dangerous. They should be turned off when they're not being used. Okay. I think so we, we have I would relook at this and yeah. possibly erect it on a commercial structure okay. on the top of a factory. This is real deal stuff here. Like we are being experimented on every day. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments, Matthew. All right. So if I don't see anyone else from the public uh, to present, then I will put the recommendation on uh, the floor. It's that the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following recommendation to the next meeting of Council. Recommendation that Council pass a resolution supporting the proposed radio communication tower location on the subject land, namely 153 11th line. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Hammer? Councillor Dorn, second, put it on the table. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's on the table. So, um, Council, we're going to add your questions to the questions from the public, and then we'll try to get some response from staff to them if we can do that. So, questions, Councillor Dorn, and then Deputy Merrill. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions for Tracy. If I may. Thank you. Um, the, the report uh, references a couple of times that the lands are rural, uh, but our official plan designation is deferred residential. Um, is there any possibility that this tower could be considered for some other location that is not within residential zone? To you, Madam Chair, the tower location um, was described as rural in character, not in land use uh, with respect to your official plan and your zoning bylaw. Uh, towers um, and service providers want to be near roadways and where people live. Uh, there is a trend that more people are using their cellular devices as opposed to landlines, and with the alert readiness program, more people are wanting reception from their home in case there's an emergency, they want to be uh, alerted immediately. Um, moving the tower, uh, we have looked at alternate locations and Rogers specifically has identified this area as a, an area that needs more coverage. A lot of uh, clients from Rogers have said that traveling the roadway on their way to uh, the mountain have had drop calls and a lot of areas uh, within the existing residential um, have also said that they have concerns with uh, lack of coverage. So we want to provide services uh, within the municipality um, for existing traffic, existing residential and future development as well. So they want to be near people as much as possible without having the visual impacts. Now trees create a good buffer and this particular location was chosen because the trees are high, it creates a visual buffer and the style of tower was also chosen to help blend in the skyline. Um, a monopole tower is usually a solid white and it reflects against the sky. A uh, lattice tripole our self-support tower, which is what is designed, um, is wide on the bottom and peaks narrow at the top, and it blends well because the scenery and the characteristic of the area um, looks like a, like a hydro tower. Um, it blends well with the skyline. Okay, thank you. And to carry on, um, in the planning justification report, uh, there is reference to uh, when Harbor Street uh, which is just a road allowance uh, right now, would be completed and pushed through to that area that the tower could be or would be removed. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Yes, it was brought to our attention during pre-application consultation with administration that there is a road uh, proposed and the easements have already been uh, referred to in the survey and the Proximity of the proposed tower is approximately seven meters away from where a proposed road would go. Uh, the life expectancy of a tower is normally about 20 years. 
and uh, Shared Network Canada will enter into a written agreement that the tower will be removed at the time when that road becomes uh, constructed and then this way it will not have any impact on the roadway and its construction. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, so at that height, so uh, 200 um, feet, that's roughly, by my math, about 16 story, equivalent to a 16 story building. Uh, is there latitude to reduce the height? Height is certainly something that we would like to hear uh, comments on. Uh, one concern is, is that uh, a 60 meter tower will cover only approximately two kilometers in radius and the area that has a void is approximately two kilometers in radius between the, the lake and the mountain and some of the highways. The closest tower is to the north, about 1.6 kilometers away. Um, so the tower will be servicing southward. Um, if you reduce the tower, you may require more towers to help cover that, that radius. So if you reduce it, then you come down to a smaller radius to like one kilometer to 1.5 kilometers. Um, and that is certainly something that we're very sensitive about making sure that there are not a lot of towers. Co-location is always an important factor when designing and, and locating towers. So anybody who also wants to uh, provide service in this area, we'd encourage them to co-locate on this particular tower and not build any more towers in the area. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our, just for ease here not to have Tracy going up and down, are any other committee members have a question through to Tracy? Councillor Hamlin. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that if Harbour Street was built, uh, the why would the tower have to be moved? What's the rule around that? It was engineering comments uh, from administration that seven meters from the roadway may have some implications with some sight lines and um, visual impacts of people driving around on, onto the pro new proposed road. So we're certainly sensitive of that particular concern and willing to remove the tower completely once that road is constructed. And with towers, do you, have, do you usually uh, leave an area in case the tower was to topple? so that it wouldn't uh, hurt residents or whatever the exist, you know, land use is around it. Self-support towers um, collapse on itself. So if there was any structural problems or, or any uh, reason why it would collapse, it would fall flat on itself as opposed to like timbering over. The compound area is very, very small. It's a 15 meter by 15 meter fence compound area that has a 1.8 meter fence. So the Tower has no guy wires and it would be self-contained with its cabinets at the base. So there would be uh, no concern with the, the tower falling beyond that perimeter. The reason I ask is you do see these horrific sites with wind turbines toppled over. So you have never seen a, or heard of a, one of these cell towers toppling? No, they've been designed and engineered so that they will collapse on itself and fall straight down. Okay, um, and I have another question, um, and I just wanted wondered if um, I had wanted to make use of Schedule C of the official plan, and Trevor told me it was in a presentation folder. Does that make sense to somebody? <laughs> so I was wondering if we could put that up because it's a map of uh, yeah. Can it be any bigger? When I looked at it on my desk, it was huge. <laughs> uh, okay, so on that map, are you able to identify where your tower is, or do you need my help? <laughs> I think I need your help. <laughs> can, can it, I don't even know how I can do this. Does this have a And then the point. 
I'm not allowed to use the remote control, just so you know. <laughs> okay. oh, to the rescue, please. Okay, can I can I use this one? Is that possible? No, no. Please, Councilor Hammond. All right. So the um, as I understand it, it's for you. So and what I got is zero when I was looking. You can see the yellow line here on the north side. So we have in this yellow uh, block here, future low, medium density residential. That's what our future tells us. And so uh, they, thank you. <laughs> so this yellow block here, which is on the north side of the mountain, is designated for low density uh, and medium density residential. And the tower would be about here. OK, so uh, sorry for that. So I was also interested because your planning justification report does speak to the advantage of this site uh, because it is currently a rural area. And I heard you address that this was an advantage and it's a rural area now. But my question is, uh, if this was a residential area and it's developed with townhomes and single family lots, and let's even assume it was so developed today. What would be the requirements? Like, what do we need to be planning for if this is approved? What kind of setbacks would there be? I, I heard you say that if it was seven meters to a road, it would come down. So what happens if there's homes there and this is a big subdivision? Thank you, Madam Chair. Industry Canada, again, your approval authority, um, has no setback requirements. Um, they don't have any land use requirements at all. It then would fall under your protocol. And again, your official plan and your zoning bylaw would not apply here. Um, so we have to take a look at where the services are needed. So this is a utility, just like hydro, water, cable. This is something that services residential, businesses, industrial, commercial. Um, Rogers, to tell us in Freedom Bell, they want to be near people. And it's about trying to find a location that has some visual uh, amenities or, or a decrease in visual impact um, to the people because it is a utility that people are requiring as a necessity. So having it in a residential area, that is very common as well. Uh, your protocol says is that it's encouraged to be located in industrial first. Um, it does not prohibit any locations um, in, a, in addition to just being in, encouraged in industrial first. So, uh, and I have, a call, I have a question to staff about that, but just on this, because you say the land use considerations, and I heard you say you're a land use planner, so I was expecting when I read this some kind of analysis of our land use documents, and I realize federal legislation takes priority priority over municipal, but they do ask for our comments, so I'm assuming they're going to read them. So one of the things that we get to look at is location and what will this be beside as we're building our community. Um, and I was just, as I say, confused because what you say here is the property is rural and suitable for a tower installation. And then you go on and say, no residential properties in the immediate area of the proposed tower. Um, you know, location of tower has been selected to preserve as much of the rural land as possible. So I just have to ask you again, you know, and, and, and I realize there's a, there's a denial because this is going to be a big residential community. And then there's another aspect that I'm asking you, and I'm not asking you about denial. 
if housing is going to be put in here, and I'll just ask you this, should we be putting certain setbacks from those homes? Like, what is the standard if these are going in the middle of a new residential community? Like, should we be at the same time be rezoning the lands around that and saying the setbacks from this tower for, uh, you know, rear yard, set yard, yard setbacks from homes should be 100 meters? Like, what is, what, what, what's good planning? You're a planner, I'm going to ask you. What's good planning? Through you, Madam Chair. Yeah, sorry, through you. I would never say that. Sure. Okay. So you are correct. Um, this, is, this is not a land use exercise. This is a, an exercise about visual impacts. And if there is anything unique about the, your area as part of comments to Industry Canada that we should be aware of um, that makes this particular tower um, in a location that has some negative impacts with respect to the way it looks, its design, its height, its location, and so forth. So you cannot apply zoning setbacks to a tower. It is not regulated. It is completely exempt. That is something Industry Canada has, has stepped in and unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you see it, um, has created that regulation. Uh, same with uh, health. It's all regulated under Safety Code 6. All providers must get a license that Industry Canada regulates prior to issuing that permit to be able to go on the tower. So that's how they regulate safety. Uh, they have, Industry Canada has said it does not have any impact on property values and that it's, it's up to the municipality to develop a protocol, not a land use mechanism or a setback mecha mechanism. Towers are available to be built where there's a need. All right, thank you. And Deputy Mayor Hall has a question with respect to one of your comments there, and then I'll get to the mayor. Uh, thank you. I, I have uh, two questions. The one is specific, though, to the comment about visual impact. Um, there's been a lot of commentary and, and uh, forward thinking as it relates to the residential build-out to the west. Uh, the impact that the community is having is that as the residential build-out or the build-out of the community continues, uh, we are faced, and we heard it loud and clear, quite frankly, in the last election, uh, that we are losing our natural amenities. And I haven't heard tonight, but on the 11th line of the northern boundary is one of our last remaining town-owned natural amenities. And uh, I think that consideration has to be given that, yes, this is a function of life and it's a function of reality, but, uh, and, you know, I think if I ask the audience tonight, you know, who was on council 25 years ago that approved the, the building of the police station? Some may remember one or two names. So 25 years from now, when they ask, uh, well, who were, who were the people who had the lack of foresight to see that we had this beautiful natural amenity, one of the last within the community, uh, within this western node, and who voted to put in the tower? Uh, people won't uh, recall the names, but they'll perhaps comment on the lack of foresight. And so that, that's my comment, is that we're, we're talking about the build-out, that's going to come. That, that, we don't have a lot of control, but we certainly can comment as it relates to the visual impact. And we heard it loud and clear during the election. Uh, this is a, a hidden, maybe not so much after this conversation, but it's a, a hidden jewel, it's a hidden asset. I don't think our, even our own town staff have been given an opportunity to really look at the end of the 11th line and the property that we own. Um, at some point, we probably will assume the county property to the east that's the current landfill. And all of those lands will become an opportunity for, for the community in a, in a passive recreational sense. And I think we need to correct that. So that's my comment. I do have a question specific to the physical land, if I could ask. Um, sure. Of clarification, the the woman, the resident, uh, and my apologies if I forgot your name, but who lives at the end of the eleventh line, uh, fair comment specific to the land. Does anybody know that the property appears to have been? First of all, is the property owned by the applicant, or is it privately owned, and this is a lease arrangement? This is a lease arrangement. Okay, so was the property subdivided prior to this arrangement being made? Because no. it appears to have been subdivided now, and we've got a smaller parcel that does front the tent of the eleventh but the balance of the property does front the tent. Is that correct? 
This, this particular location yeah. is on the entire balance of the property, which does front onto both the roads. So it's a, a large parcel. So could I maybe just get that clarified for our next council meeting? Because when I look on land registry, it does appear that there are actually two parcels of land owned by the same owner. Right, thank you. Mayor Saunderson, sorry. Your turn. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to either Tracy or Brian, um, I, just to start off, I was surprised to hear that a tower of this size would only serve a two kilometer radius. So I'm wondering how, how many uh, service towers are there in the Collingwood area? Can I maybe answer that for you? Through you, Madam Chair, I do have uh, mapping exercises <coughs> done to be able to provide staff with that information and, and the, the public when it's available. Um, within a 10 kilometer radius, there are approximately 10 towers. Uh, some of them are owned by Rogers, some of them are owned by Bell, and some of them are on top of residential high rises. And that being said then, uh, of any of the freestanding towers, uh, because our protocol lists A to D, which does not talk about private lands in uh, residential areas, uh, are there any of these other towers located in residential areas? Through you, Madam Chair. No, I don't know where they are located with respect to their land use. And then just as a final question through to, oh, Nancy, do you have an answer to that? Uh, I'm sorry, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I, I can think of a couple that are perhaps in um, residential areas. Uh, there is one on Ontario Street, uh, right beside the ambulance station. Um, and I believe that would be um, that kind of an area. Uh, there's another one um, that is at the back of um, Georgian Bay Resort, and that is an area where it's, at the current time, it's commercial, but there are applications in for that to become a residential piece of land, and uh, the owners are, are proposing to keep the tower where it is. And then just as a final question through you, Madam Chair, to Nancy, um, on the protocol it, under location, it does list, um, it says that it shall consider the following site locations itemized below in priority order A being the most desirable option and B being the least desirable option and it lists um, a number of options, the final option being a new structure on private lands with co-location in industrially zoned or designated areas and this is not that. Is that an exhaustive list? Do you consider that an exhaustive list or uh, does residential fall somewhere in that rubric? Uh, through Madam Chair to uh, Mayor Saunderson, uh, it would be my view that um, certainly our, our first choice would be an industrial area, uh, but we have in the past also considered other designations uh, because frankly in this part of town there's very little that is industrial and if the true spacing of these towers is every couple of kilometers then it would be very difficult to put anyone in the west side of town. And is there any flex? Sorry, I said that was my last question. I do have one more. <laughs> so through you to Tracy, is there any flexibility then if this property does front both on the 10th and 11th lines, as suggested by um, Marika, I think it was, is there an ability to relocate the tower so that it fronts on to the 10th? Shared Network Canada did take a look at that as an option, and it was not their preferred coverage area. They lose a lot of potential customers with Rogers and TELUS when they move further to the other side. Um, but I, I do want to remind the committee that uh, one of the other options in your report is, is that you could do a uh, concurrence with recommendation. So if there's any particular recommendation that the committee would like to, to add to your resolution, that's certainly something I could take back to the client and have them review. All right, and, and so if I, I would just take a moment then, to, I think this kind of piggybacks on what you just said, Tracy. Mike, uh, I think that one of the residents' letters that we received uh, referred to maybe moving it uh, within the center of the uh, property of the owner who has leased uh, as a leasing arrangement. Um, then I, I take it that the infrastructure becomes um, an issue, but is it a really a big problem to uh, build a gravel road to moving it into the center of that property so that the impact becomes uh, the problem of the property owner who's made the lease as opposed to 
the surrounding residents who are already there. Thank you, Madam Chair. It does increase the cost significantly when you're driving a, uh, a, a greater distance to get to the tower and bringing in the electricity. Um, in this particular site, um, you do have a wood lot in the back and the location has been selected to help preserve as much of that natural heritage feature characteristic as possible and to stay out of that natural wood lot. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask the question on their behalf because they couldn't be here tonight, so. All right. Um, Are there any other people from the public who wish to comment? Thank you, Tracy. All right. Oh, Marika. Sure. Come on up. I, I do have a you, I need you to come to the mic, though, please, Mrs. Hanish. Thank you. I do have a question for Tracy, and that is, um, I, I like her comment. I'd just like to read something else from my notes. At a, a European conference on cell phone cell tower siting, um, they of course uh, determined the levels of radiation. But what I wanted to say that over 100 physicians and scientists at Harvard and Boston University schools of public health have called cellular towers a radiation hazard. And 33 delicate positions from seven countries have declared cell phone towers a public health emergency. I'd like um, Tracy's comments on, um, on on those statements. Right. I think, in fairness to Tracy, and, and she can come up and respond if she likes. But I think um, our um, our federal legislation has dictated, and they have stipulated through a health code and through Industry Canada that this is um, no. where it is in Canada. And I don't think it would be fair to put uh, Tracy on the spot to answer in terms of other uh, international determinations. I, I just, that's not her job. Thank but I, I understand your message, message. You. I just want to say in rebuttal yeah, to sure. your comment, I'd like to say that our government also told us that thalidomide was okay, asbestos was okay. Yeah. Um, and our blood supply was completely safe. Mm -hmm. No, I understand your comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so are there any um, amendments uh, proposed to this? Do you wish to vote on this? And if it um, doesn't pass, propose something else. That's all good. Yeah. Oh, if it passes, it goes with the reclamation of the public. Uh, so we could attach commentary as uh, Tracy did describe to this before we vote on it. Is there any um, additions to this that you would like to make in conditions? Councillor Doherty? Um, I, I would not support this application, uh, first of all, because it does not meet our protocols. Um, it is um, in a residential, deferred residential area, notwithstanding the fact that the federal government does not recognize our zoning, uh, still it does not fall within our own protocols. Uh, so that would be my, my primary concern. Um, in addition, uh, I am concerned about the height, and I would ask the question if there was any possibility that that tower could be reduced in height, and further, that that tower be better camouflaged more along the lines of what we have seen in the commercial zone behind the Georgia Bay Hotel where it is, um, I think it's referred to as a stealth tower. It looks like a flagpole and it has a flag flying at the top of it, certainly much less statically objectionable than, than what we're seeing in front of us today. Okay. Um. Could I have that's not exactly a recommendation because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I think some, I, I, if we could work with something uh, specific wording that you would that you would like to attach to this I think because what staff has made it clear here is is that we are not the approving authority so this is going to get done so whether we uh, the concurrence issue with comment may help I think a total objection 
I'm not sure will help us in terms of having them see what it is we want um, or would prefer. I'll take another run at that. Okay. So um, primarily, uh, we would I, we, I would not support um, positioning in the deferred residential zone, but if that were overridden by uh, uh, the federal government, then I would ask for consideration for a reduced height and um, an improved appearance or camouflage appearance. So procedurally, I think we're still contrary to the original motion by, I know. Uh, <clears throat> so I think if you, I mean, you can vote to um, defeat this if that's, that's your wish, but if you want to add something else into it in case it, the recommendation that goes to council has it in it, then that may be a better way. And I, it could be as simple as removing your would not support and just adding that conditions that you would prefer reduced height at the risk of more towers in a residential area um, that you would want improved camouflage. Um, speaking just for myself, my inclination is would be to uh, decline the recommendation and come back with that as an alternative. Um, the deputy clerk just advised me that if we if we defeat this, it simply goes to council without a recommendation. <clears throat> I'm having difficulty trying to convey the intention. So, if we want to defeat this altogether, and you want to put forward another um, total recommendation, then the deputy clerk advised me that's fine. It can, you can defeat this one send another recommendation to council, but at the end of the day, council will have both those recommendations to consider. Okay. All right, so if there, yes, Mayor Saunderson. Sorry, just before we get out of the gates, uh, so right now we have, one, uh, we have one of three options, or it's the recommendation that we support the existing request outright. It is, but I, the, the deputy clerk may advise me differently, but I think that it would be easy to do con concurrence with conditions by amending this one. But to... But if we defeat it, then we can't bring it back on with the conditions. So, as I understand Councillor Doherty's position, she uh, is not prepared to make any uh, changes to the... She would rather see, I think, it voted on defeated, and then as a fallback, say, if you do proceed with it, then we would ask for the following conditions. Uh, I guess what I'm prepared to do is, is say that uh, I would uh, put in recommendations for a height uh, restriction and a relocation within the within the property to minimize the uh, the impact, the aesthetic impact uh, in the area. Um, so I guess I'm prepared to have approval with uh, recommendations, and then if that gets defeated, then we know it's an objection. Okay. All right. All right, so then the amendment to add the um, conditions is moved by Mayor Saunderson yes. for those three items, um, reduced height, uh, relocation within the property, and improved visual in, in terms of uh, camouflage. Was that correct? Yep. Okay. Do I have a seconder for those conditions to attach to this vote? I'll second it to get it on the floor. And all those in favor? Opposed, and that is defeated. So no conditions. So now we are voting specifically on the motion to um, to support the proposed uh, radio communication tower location. All those in favor? All those opposed? And that is unanimous. All right. Next recommendation. Am I in? I guess there is none. That's just how it goes. All right. So that's uh, will be our recommendations that go to uh, council and. Uh, We will go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, participation and on that item. Thank, Thank you for my indication that I'm going to remove myself. From right. Outside. Thank you. So Mayor Saunderson will be recusing himself for 6.4.
Right, so P2019-10 is the authorization bylaw to execute a development agreement specific to 270 Minnesota Street. Nancy, can you uh, set this up for us, please? Yeah, happy to, Madam Chair. Uh, there has been a consent for um, a property on Minnesota Street, and uh, at one of the conditions of that consent was that there be a development agreement that would require the garages not to face out onto Minnesota Street and be turned to the side. Um, and because it was a condition that was specifically um, placed in that severance, uh, it does have to come here um, to be uh, approved. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this agenda item? Seeing none, I will put the recommendation on the floor. It is that the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following recommendation to the next meeting of Council. Recommendation that Council enact and pass an authorization bylaw to execute a development agreement for the property addressed as 270 Minnesota Street. Mover and a seconder. Deputy Mayor Hull, Councillor Hamlin. Any further comments? Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I guess this question would be through you to um, Ms. Farrar. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we have uh, um, seen situations where uh, infill projects, uh, while they have met um, the letter of the zoning bylaws, have not, in effect, uh, been uh, complementary or even um, um, in, well integrated with the existing neighborhood. And I'm thinking about um, recent um, deputations in regard to Campbell Street and uh, uh, previous to that, Niagara Street. So my question is, what measures would we put in place to ensure that we that we have ultimately an infill project that is complementary and does integrate well with the current neighborhood? Director Fair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to uh, Councillor Doherty. Well, the lot that is um, the more northern half of this property, uh, because it is adjacent to a designated heritage structure, um, the house that is going on the northern half, we have required that they do a heritage impact assessment on that property. So um, the northern, the house to the northern side will be uh, certainly regulated. They have done a heritage impact assessment, and we have also had our standard heritage uh, consultant review and have a look at that heritage impact assessment and uh, ensure that the new house going on the north is in keeping with the existing de designated house that is to the north of that. So that, in my view, that helps quite uh, considerably as far as the house on the northern side. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, the vote then on the recommendation. All those in favor? That carries unanimously. Mayor Saunderson, if you could return. So our next report is P2019-11, a draft approval of a plan of subdivision for 585-96th Street. And I'll turn this over to Director Ferrer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and this is really connected to the next report, and so uh, it is the same property. So uh, Madam Chair, with, with your indulgence, I think we should almost deal with them <coughs> together as opposed to uh, dealing with them separately. Sounds great. Um, just because they are both um, both dealing with the same lands. And uh, Madam Chair, uh, just um, for everyone's information, and I like to be right up front about these things, uh, my son does live in Chamberlain. Um, I don't think I have any particular 
uh, financial interest in this whatsoever, um, but my son does live uh, on Chamberlain. He does not back on this property, so he's not that close. Okay, just Thank so you. that everybody, everybody knows. <laughs> Um, so we, we, what we have here is an application for uh, an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, the official plan amendment is to redesignate a piece of property uh, that fronts on uh, the 6th Street and that is for an apartment building. Um, then the back part of the property where there is not a uh, official plan amendment um, the back part of the property that is currently in a medium density residential designation. Uh, that property is proposed to be used for townhouse dwellings. Um, so there's a zoning that would put that bylaw amendment that would um, des or allow from a zoning perspective the back property to be used for townhouses. Um, the townhouse, and I can give you the numbers of, of properties. We have uh, 64 apartment dwelling units proposed and 40 street townhouse dwellings proposed. I think we have a few more. Oops. There's the, uh, the plan showing both the townhouses and the apartments. And we also have a plan of subdivision because there is the proposed creation of a number of public streets. Um, and the public streets will ultimately, uh, and I believe they, they show on the plan, uh, they will ultimately connect with the subdivision to the south. Uh, and there is certainly a road plan that is being developed for this area, including the adjacent property, uh, so that it, it does all, uh, at the end of the day, um, make sense and fit together as a neighborhood. There's, um, yes, there's, okay, so there's, we've got showing the townhouse portion of the plan and I think we also have there's the actual townhouse layout that is proposed and that's an elevation uh, showing the kind of townhouses that are proposed um, for this uh, for this site. Uh, we do have uh, in attendance um, Madam Chair uh, both the planner and the engineer are here to uh, handle any detailed questions as well. Um, but certainly we would be more than happy to um, answer any of those questions. Um, the, and there's no, no question that the development is quite dense. I'm, I'm not going to suggest that it isn't. Uh, what we did do and what, what perhaps isn't in the report is that the townhouse section of this development, um, it is at our 50 people and jobs per hectare. Um, it's the apartment portion of this site uh, because it is a four-story apartment building um, that puts the number and up to the 91 people uh, per hectare. Uh, so I want to be clear that it, the townhouse portion is uh, down at our standard 50 per people per hectare. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, certainly there's there's been a lot um, of information uh, in the two reports. Uh, I think, Madam Chair, uh, I don't. My understanding is that the uh, applicant has been dealing with a number of the residents in the area and they've had a number of discussions with the residents in the area um, and I, I'm hopeful that that's you know that they have satisfied a number of the uh, issues um, of the residents in the area um, and certainly I know that they were all contacted prior to this evening so I don't know how many are here or how many we will hear from uh, but Madam Chair I think we will um, try and answer any questions that <coughs> come up either between myself or the uh, planner for the file or the engineer. Okay. And I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So in the gallery, are there anyone, is there anyone wishing to speak to this agenda item? Okay. So the gentleman in the front row and then I believe a planner in the back. Good evening. Uh, my name is Doug Mitchell, myself and my wife. We live at 47 Chamberlain Crescent. We back on to this new development. Uh, by the way, those are very nice pictures, but the architectural drawings have not been approved in any way relating to the subdivision, so it cannot be assumed that your development will look like this. 
We appreciate that we are probably allocated five minutes, which likely will not be sufficient time to comment on the 11-page planning document, planning department report, the nine-page conditions report, and other materials. A copy of this presentation will be provided to the clerk in electronic format after this session, if so wishes. No adequate water treatment plan. If you purchased a new car at the time gasoline was not available, would that make sense? The engineering staff of the City of Collingwood has determined that the town's water treatment plant is operating close to capacity under maximum daytime demands. They have recommended that a holding symbol be placed on the zoning for the land until such time as there is adequate water supply. If this subdivision plan is approved, assuming there are no appeals, planning staff assume the town will issue a tree cutting permit, which will result in all the trees down by April of this year. At this time, we have no idea the timing for the modifications to the town's water treatment plant. So why is there a proposal to approve this subdivision and cut down the trees? Are there other subdivision plans where trees are being cut and a hold being placed on the zoning? Trees and parkland. With regard to parkland in the development, it is indicated that the city would take cash in lieu of parkland and that green space would be considered in the next phase of the development. I assume that it is the council and not staff who will make the final decision. So how is it assumed this council would agree to such terms? Based on a traffic study that was prepared by the consultants for the developer, it is indicated that a 207 townhouse units and 154 high-rise density units would be built in phase two of the development. Where in phase two is the parkland? If it in fact that this that phase is ever constructed, which the developer's consultants suggest would be built by 2025. Why wait for parkland? Are you giving me my no, Mr. No, Mr. Rich, I was actually going to say, just take your time. Don't feel the need to rush. You could actually take five minutes on each of the next two. So I'd be very happy to give you the 10 all at once if that's what you need. Fair enough. Thank you. I will slow down. Thank you. One might say there is no space for parkland in the current plan. Yes, that is obvious. Then why is the current plan not being revised to accommodate parkland? Does one just assume that the developer puts forward is acceptable? It should be noted that the conditions agreements, no trees or soil disturbances shall take place before the Ontario Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport provided appropriate acceptance. One assumes that permission has not yet been received. So why is this subdivision agreement before council until all conditions have been met? If you recall, there was another subdivision in Collingwood, I believe it's on High Street where trees were cut down on a, for a proposed subdivision, and then the developer walked away. There is not any proposal to replace trees that have been removed. Does Collingwood not do anything to protect trees in our community? NBCA, the Conservation Authority. In their letter dated September 4th, 2018, NBCA stated that a mid-September bird survey does not follow the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas Guide for participating protocols. They state, as in season, bird survey needs to be completed between April 15th to April 30th. If a tree cutting permit is not issued at this time, that study will not be completed. So, is another bird study going to be completed? There is no comment anywhere about that. What is not detailed in the reporting from the Planning Department but the comments of the NBCA in their letter dated December 5th to the town of Collingwood. They requested eight items of concern to them, requested a geo, various items, uh, and they are commented upon in the report. NBCA requires additional information in order to complete their review, and additional comments may be provided in the future. Paragraph 24 to 29 of the Conditions Agreement provides items that need to be approved, but that agreement indicates that they have not been completed. Why approve a subdivision until all conditions have been met, especially those coming from the Conservation Authority? Fees charged. I may be reaching out here, but it's just an observation. It's my accounting, accounting background that brings this out. 
It is stated that the subdivision agreement provides that processing and administrative fees to be paid prior to the building permit issuance in accordance with the current policies. Does this mean that if the fees charged by the city should change, the current fee stretch schedule would apply? And if so, why? You might say this is open to interpretation. Fair enough. But why leave it open to interpretation? This development will take a few years and the fee structure will definitely change. Affordable housing and complementary use. The planning report states that this development provides an opportunity for more affordable housing. To the best of my knowledge, ah, you had pity, thank you. <laughs> does make a difference. To be, the best of my knowledge, this development is not assisted housing and no prices have been provided for the houses in this that are to be built. Town houses are not necessarily affor affordable. Just ask someone who's bought one recently. It seems to assume facts that have not been presented. It is stated in the report that complementary uses include community services. The conditions agreement specifically states that school boards indicate that students may be transported, accommodated in temporary facilities out of the neighborhood school area, nor is it guaranteed that accommodation in schools yet to be built is not guaranteed. If accommodation out of the area, how is this complementary to this subdivision? Review of the presentation, the various representations by residents. The planning report indicates that submissions were received from some residents in the area. Those submissions were reviewed by Georgian Planning Solutions and Houston Engineering and Management, the consultants associated with the developer. It is acknowledged that these companies are professionals, but is this not like the fox guarding the hen house? They apparently intended to provide feedback to the city staff on the comments received that matrix was on the city's website, but the letters from the residents was not. In the letter sent by Marie and Doug Mitchell, dated May 8, 2018, we identified various items that we consider should be addressed. Their analysis did not mention all of the items, but they did cover quite a few. We do not know if the consultants covered all of the concerns of the other residents. I can only speak to my letter. They excluded our comments related to adequate sewage, which suggested that nothing should be approved until the master servicing study was complete. An air study and noise study was conducted by RWDI on December 14, 2017. At that particular time, in the winter months, close to the Christmas season, the results might have been distorted because of the lack of activity. There was not a second testing during the summer when the noise and air quality might be more intense to provide a better picture to, of a baseline for traffic in the area. However, the review by the planners professionals did not mention this aspect. There is nothing in the planning report to indicate whether city staff reviewed the submissions themselves or rely on the developer's consultants. Is this how the city reviews comments from the residents? Conditions agreement, which is another very detailed document and very well done, I must say. Included in the appendix, if the submission is from planning department, is the staff agreement related to conditions. There are some items, possibly more, that this committee may want to review. Prior to final approval, the owner shall submit a traffic impact study. If this has not already been received, why is the committee considering something that has yet to be submitted? So Mr. Mitchell, just so you know, you have about 30 seconds if there's something you really want to get across. You know, I was on my final item, so I will Excellent. stop right now. When I'm no, you have 30 seconds. Just finish. The conditions agreement specifically states that the subdivision agreement is exempt related to re remediation works and general site earthworks. One wonders whose approval it refers to and why is there an exception? Various reports required in consultation with the Nakawasaka Valley Conservation Authority prior to the salt site alteration. Uh, I discussed that earlier. 
It is stated that 1.8 meter wooden fan privacy fence would be built, which is a very good idea. It doesn't say when that would take place. And I would thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for the water. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay, so um, we staff will have taken notes and what they can't answer we will do um, after we've heard from other uh, public members. So I believe uh, next is the Oh, okay, sure. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, members of committee, uh, town staff, Mr. Mim. My name is George Barron. I live at 59 Chamberlain Crescent. I've lived there since 2008 when my home was uh, built. And uh, I'm a little bit removed to the south. Uh, from where the Mitchells reside. I mean, this, this development doesn't uh, back right on to me, but it's not that far distant. Uh, and uh, when I was here in April, we made some comments, uh, and I listed, and I wanted to protect my interests uh, if there is some uh, future uh, development to be addressed. So I uh, listened carefully to uh, Mr. Mitchell and the points that he made. Uh, I, I've been coming to the Collingwood area. I grew up in Owen Sound. I've been coming to the Collingwood area. I built a ski cabin when I finished uh, law school and uh, worked in Toronto and came up, and that was in 1971. I mean, Collingwood uh, was always a community in which I had particular interest because I had determined uh, back then when I built a ski cabin, I was going to move up here at some point in my life uh, once my uh, Toronto uh, commitment uh, was satisfied and so in 2008 actually 2004 I moved up here and um, and uh, with, there was a four-year hiatus uh, with a home and uh, I resided at the uh, once uh, gray elephant uh, building down on the waterfront which is now Sunset uh, Cove and that's what the only point I want to address is that I mean I, I look at this report we're putting a lot of faith into a developer. I have no idea who the developer is. I know it's not a local person, somebody from the greater uh, Horseshoe area. I've made some inquiries. I believe it's probably out of the Burlington area down Hamilton Way. Uh, we have no idea who the developer is. It seems to me we're putting a lot of faith in the developer. And my only uh, comment is we don't want another gray elephant on our hands as we had down here. Uh, as you drove into Collingwood, it was there for everyone to see. Uh, as Mr. Mitchell indicates, uh, this seems to be a lot of uh, uh, effort that the developer has gone to to move this report to where it is, but there are so many conditions that uh, I would urge all of you to move very carefully with this and that if if it appears that uh, this is something that uh, is going to be uh, acceptable to uh, the community, that the developer make a substantial bond uh, because of all the uh, outstanding conditions to be satisfied. The last thing I want to see is some field that uh, is open to the elements. It's uh, it, it's a uh, it's a, a soil situation that could be quite problematic if you're talking about erecting a, uh, an apartment building of four stories, uh, uh, which is a significant building. Uh, there are all kinds of difficulties that I could uh, think that might arise uh, in the uh, construction of this. Uh, I don't see any green uh, area at all. The one thing that is particularly of annoyance to me and Mr. McDonald's here, uh, we had some, we had lots of discussions on this, was the fence that goes uh, behind all the properties on Chamberlain Crescent. There's a fence that separates the properties uh, from the Niagara Valley uh, conservation uh, land. And I note that, at least my understanding is, and I tried to note in the uh, schematic that was put on of the development. I don't believe there's any fence there. So what they're doing, they're getting something that we didn't get. I don't know who this guy is, but we had all the residents on our street backing on to Black Ash Creek come before the town council with a deposition. We'd signed everybody up and we got nowhere with it. 
this guy who's developing this suddenly gets access to the green belt and puts it in the report, that, or it goes in the report as being something that uh, is uh, advantageous to the development. I don't see any green space in this place at all, save and except for that. It's annoying as hell that he gets it and I don't. <laughs> I'm looking through the fence to a nice strip of property out behind me. When we had the developer for our area uh, agree to take the money, which is forty or fifty thousand dollars, give it to the town of Collingwood, so we could put a lovely berm out there with some perennial plants and bushes. And that got absolutely nowhere. It was a lot of effort, and we got nowhere with it. So I would ask you to approach this matter with extreme caution, and don't leave us hanging uh, with a situation that would be in tantamount to being intolerable. Thanks for hearing Thank me. Thank you. And if, if you could sign the uh, yeah, well, list behind you, yeah, yeah, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. My name is Kristen Reddy. I'm from Georgian Planning Solutions, and I'm the agent acting on behalf of the, uh, the developer and the property owner. I have with me uh, Paul Hessen, he's the cons uh, consulting engineer. I also have the developer here with us this evening, uh, Art Joyce, um, and I just wanted to make you aware that he actually is the owner of the Collingwood Brewery and has lived in the area for the past 12 years. So he is not from the city, he is a, a resident, he's part of our community and um, is very excited to move forward with this uh, proposal in front of you this evening. So I want to thank Nancy. She uh, covered a lot of the items that I wanted to talk to you about this evening in regards to the, the proposal and what it is that's in front of you. Um, and uh, Mr. Mitchell made you aware also of the matrix that discussed the, the issues that came up at the public meeting and, um, and how they were addressed through our comments. I also just wanted to talk to you about uh, that we've been going through this process for two years now. So in communication with the staff, um, over the last two years, we've gone through the pre-consultation meeting, we've had the development review committee meetings, we had our own open house on April the 4th at the public library in which we hand-delivered invitations to the residents that back onto the development and sort of around that area. Uh, and we had our public meeting on the 30th of April of last year. Uh, so really, we uh, are really here to answer any questions that there may be, um, and I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Okay. Um, so if there are any, um, Ms. Rennie, that you heard that from the presentations from the public that you could answer here, um, I invite you to, to do so. And then I'm going to turn it over to staff once council asks their, uh, their questions. But uh, they may be questions that uh, council had, the committee members had anyway. So uh, so I will sort of make my did way Did you make a list? Yeah. Yes, okay, I made great. a quick list. I was sort of thinking while that was happening. Um, in regards to, um, let me just skip here. So in terms of Mr. Mitchell's comments um, and the noise uh, review, that our, our noise study was actually peer reviewed. So the town actually went out and had it peer reviewed. Um, so those, that information is available. In regards to the breeding birds and the environmental consulting, we did re we did respond with from our environmental consultant on how we addressed that that time frame. So the town has all of that information, and the NVCA accepted our response. Thank you, or team. Um, some I can't actually even think of the rest of the comments off the Tree top. Tree clearing of my early. Tree clearing early. So in regards to our property, um, we do have to clear the trees in order to start the process. We have to um, raise the grade and put in some fill into the property in order to, um, actually, I'm gonna let Paul answer that question. Sure. Yes, um, hi, Madam Chair. So the recommendation in the geotechnical report was that the site be raised and one of the requirements of the municipality is that any homes that are built are a minimum uh, half meter above the water table. So the, the homes have to be, the land has to be raised to a similar elevation to where the houses on Chamberlain Crescent are. They've been raised as well from the existing grades that were there prior to the houses going in. So the recommendation in the geotech report is to, to fill the site, 
about a meter and a half of fill, and then leave it for a period of time so it can consolidate the clay and it'll, it'll uh, settle uh, an amount that will then make it acceptable for development. So by clearing the trees, we can pre-grade the site as we work through the detailed design and the conditions. And then when that's complete, it'll be ready for development. So that's, that ties into wanting to clear the site sooner rather than later. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. We'll continue on, and then if the committee members have more questions, then we'll have you back up again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Director, or no, thank you, um, yeah, Madam Chair. I just, uh, because it just came up, and I thought I should perhaps uh, raise it at this point. Uh, condition 15 is the requirement that the Block 20, which is the same area um, as is to the south, be fenced from the residential lots. So, so there is a specific requirement that, uh, that uh, the same fence as was required to the south of this property go in on this property. Thank you. I have a question relating to the Sure, come on up. Just introduce yourself. And I'm, uh, my name is Robin Stewart. I live at 41 Chamberlain, right in the middle of that <laughs> new subdivision. <clears throat> and I'm really concerned about the tree clearing. Obviously, it's my backyard. Uh, but I was wondering, you spoke to, um, you clear the trees and you raise the land and then it settles for a period. How long does it settle with nothing happening on it? Is that like settles for a month, two months, six months, a year? Use the mic, please, Paul. Uh, the recommendation in the geotech report is eight months to a year. It'll it would be monitored over that period of time by the geotechnical engineer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So if there's no one else from the public wishing to address, okay, come on forward. My name is Maria Mitchell, and my question would be, what is the quality of the proposed fence, and how will it be maintained? Uh, Madam Chair, the intent is to put up a, a privacy fence that would be on the property line, so it would be jointly owned by the adjacent property owners. And so it would be maintained by the property owners going forward, just like a typical backyard fence. Okay, all right. Thank you. Is it a wooden fence? That's what's proposed. Wooden privacy fence. Wooden privacy fence, yes. Because okay. there is a fence on the popular cell phone, and it's never more. Well, and this people. fence would be owned by the residents, so you're backing onto it. You would have a responsibility to maintain your and portion of the fence. Who says I want it in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> I believe I there's a condition yeah. oh. that in the park land conditions yeah. that speaks to uh, the property line trees. And so if there's not agreement to remove a property line tree, it's left, yeah. or they're left, and the fence just continues on, you know, on either side of the trees. Right, leaving so room for the trees. both parties have to agree for the trees to be removed right. on the property line. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. right. Okay, all right, so I'm going to put the uh, recommendation on the floor. Oh. I just have one comment. Sir? Alexander Stewart, 41 Chamberlain. And uh, my question is about the trees in the back. They're going to be eliminated. Uh, is there any plan to replace those trees with a hedge or with walnut trees or some substantial tree? Is there any plans to, uh, you know, kind of mitigate the privacy factor? I mean, the fence is five feet high. It's kind of gets part of it, but. You'd like to have some trees behind to add to that privacy concept. Okay. Thank you. I'll ask um, Director McDonald maybe to, or, oh, sorry, Director Fair, or Director McDonald, whoever wants to field that 
I think we've had some experience with this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. And, and, and I, I may bounce this to um, Mr. McDonald as well, um, but certainly my understanding is that, that no, there are not likely to be trees. There's also a drainage easement, I believe, along the back of at least a number of these lots. So we are into a situation where we have um, a drainage swale at the back of these lots. And um, I believe I'm correct on that, but uh, and the dr drainage swale is on the existing properties to the north and it will also be on, or sorry, to the south, and then it will also be on the properties to the north. So there's a drainage swale at the back of both of these yards um, that will uh, be necessary in order for uh, things to function correctly. Dr. McDonald? Uh, that is correct. Uh, there's nothing more I can add to that. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Uh, so, um, the recommendation that the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following recommendation to the next meeting of Council. Recommendation that Council grant draft approval to the 585 96th Street plan of subdivision subject to the draft plan drawing and conditions of draft approval attached. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Deputy Mayor Holman and Mayor Saunderson, thank you. All right, comments, questions? Councilor Hammond? Um, when I first looked at this, uh, I looked at the fact that it's a very dense development. And I know that our official plan talks about um, some targets that are sent out in some provincial documents, uh, which speak to 50 persons slash jobs per hectare. And as Director uh, Farrar has indicated, uh, this development comes in at 91. Uh, and also I'm aware that the same provincial document is out for review currently. Uh, and the proposal in that document would be to take these kind of sites, which are called greenfield uh, sites, to 40 persons per jobs or, or jobs per hectare. So all to say, when I started off here, I thought, this is so dense. And then I looked at the traffic report, and uh, the traffic report uh, notes that although there's 57 townhouses and 64 apartment units proposed, uh, and that's what's before us, that is a phase one. And that there is a phase two uh, that's referenced here, so that there would be a total of 207 townhouse units and 154 high density residential units um, on, on the lands to the east. So um, I started looking at our official plan document and I see that on the south side of six between high and the creek, uh, there is a huge stretch of land that has been designated for medium density uses. And of course, this is a six acre parcel of that large stretch. And uh, it might be said that that area could be considered its own neighborhood uh, because it is a large, such a large piece and, and uh, is contiguous. So then I really ask myself, uh, maybe at this stage, whether this is good planning or not on this parcel might be a bit irrelevant because maybe we should be asking ourselves a bigger question. And the bigger question, and I will come to a suggested amendment to the motion, Madam Chair. Uh, the bigger question is, how would the concept for development proposed on this sex acre parcel fit in with a concept that our staff might see for an overall plan for this neighborhood? Um, and I raise this in the context of four uh, thoughts I've had. Uh, the first is park, and some of our residents, of course, spoke to the park, and I noticed that um, Ms. Rennie's comments on the, you know, she did a matrix of uh, comments de dealing with uh, issues raised by the residents, and one of the things she notes is a community park will form part of the next phase of development on the lands to the east. Uh, I has, have asked our staff whether there's a community park planned on lands to the east, and I believe the answer was no, but there could possibly be a neighborhood park. So I asked myself, where would the neighborhood park, let's assume there is going to be a neighborhood park in this whole neighborhood, where should it go? 
uh, would part of it be on this six acres? You know, what is the concept for this area? And my second point would be, where is the density all going to go? Are we just going to have high density in the middle on this six acre parcel and the piece to the east uh, as contemplated by the traffic report? Um, what is our idea for where the high density should be in this neighborhood? Um, I also asked myself, what about a stormwater pond for this neighborhood? And because this is only a six acre piece, I see that the proposal by uh, the engineering consultant is quite consistent with what you might expect for a small parcel of urban land. Uh, it's something called an oil grit separator, which from my research means that it's underground tanks to hold uh, stormwater and clean it. But if we were developing this neighborhood um, from High Street to the creek, we might be asking ourselves, where would the stormwater pond go uh, for this large area? And then lastly, um, I, would, I noted that the traffic report did not find there was a need for traffic lights at Stewart, which is about opposite of where this acreage is. Uh, but then I said to myself, what if we were looking at the development of that whole parcel? Is, is our, our view that there would be more high density? Uh, and would there ultimately be a need for traffic lights at Stewart? And then if there was such a need, should this six acre parcel be making a contribution to the cost of those traffic lights? So uh, with those thoughts in my head, uh, I come now to my proposed motion. Uh, and I would be uh, suggesting that the staff reports on these two items be deferred for a further staff report to address how this proposed development would fit in to the overall plan for the neighborhood, uh, which is on the south side of 6th Street between High and the Creek. All right, before I, I take a seconder on a deferral, I think I'd like to ask uh, staff if they'd like to respond to the questions that Councillor Hammonds referred to. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the questions. Um, certainly, the <coughs> we have looked at this property uh, as being a component of a, of a larger piece. Uh, Councillor Hamlin, Hamlin is correct that this entire area and everything from uh, this piece to the corner to down to um, all of Creekside um, will someday form some kind of a, a neighborhood. Um, we, it would be our view that generally speaking, where would you put the high density within a neighborhood? Well, you'd put the high density adjacent to the arterial road. So it would be our view that certainly the, the high density is appropriate uh, adjacent to the main road. And the reason you do that, um, in my view, is that those uh, additional cars, because higher density uses do uh, generate more traffic, you want those to be close to uh, the main roads so that they don't have to go all the way through the subdivision to get out to the main roads. So that's why, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are um, additional higher density uses adjacent to um, 6th Street, because that is the, is the arterial road. Uh, as far as there being, uh, and, and it also would be, I guess, a, a, in my view, pretty standard planning practice for uh, the higher uses, or the higher density uses to be along the edges of the development. Uh, an example would be there's um, an apartment building right at the corner of Chamberlain and High uh, that was built a couple of years ago. There again, it's right at the edge of this development. Uh, and then the less dense uses, um, the further you get into the subdivision. Uh, is there, there is one uh, storm pond that's actually at the corner of the property uh, that was built some time ago. Um, at, the, at this point, and, and um, certainly Director McDonald can comment more than I can, but at this point, it, this property has no access to that storm pond because, frankly, there's a couple of pieces in the middle. Uh, it is our thought, and certainly we've had discussions with uh, Director Culver, that uh, what we should be doing is we should be having another neighborhood park somewhere in this vicinity. Um, there is one down at the far end of Chamberlain, but uh, when we get 
two or three properties or four properties of re uh, residential development in this area, they should have their own neighborhood park. And perhaps the, it hasn't been planned yet, but that neighborhood park might go adjacent to the storm pond, which is something that we've done in, in a number of other locations, or it may be on one of the other streets. Um, so, you know, certainly some of the things that, some of the bigger questions we have tried to, to think about, um, Madam Chair, and certainly, um, you know, we, we do try and ensure that developments are integrated, um, that we end up at the end of the day uh, with uh, complete neighborhoods that have a number of facilities that are, frankly, our residents are interested in um, having um, around their homes. Thank you. Uh, Director McDonald. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In terms of the uh, stormwater management, uh, the existing Creekside Pond yeah. was designed to take a portion of, uh, of the lands to the north of, of uh, Creekside, and uh, that would be the Phase 2 lands that uh, have been referred to, the ones that are not currently part of this application, and they would go into that pond. We definitely do want to have um, uh, regional type stormwater management facilities and that uh, that's what we looked at when we initially put the pond in in the first place. So the portion of, uh, of this property uh, will be uh, not contributing to that pond and they will have, uh, as, uh, as Councilor Hammond had mentioned, uh, they will be utilizing a, uh, an oil grid separator type uh, method. Uh, those are acceptable practices. We have uh, uh, currently have a half a dozen uh, of those uh, in place now and there's several in the works uh, on the private side there's probably uh, several dozen uh, of those type of facilities in place. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a mover for a deferral of uh, both of the uh, reports with respect to 580 and 596 Street. Do I have a seconder for the deferral? Councillor Doherty? All right. Any other questions with respect? Um, the deferral in terms of timing is. I'd like to decline that. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> Mine's a like. What is the timeline? Because deferrals are only debatable as to time. Okay. Oh, uh, time for this. When are you asking for for, for the review to come back? Oh, I don't know what's reasonable. It's six months from. I'm, I'm, I'm a six month girl tonight. I don't know if that's reasonable. Any response from staff with respect to that timeline? The CAO will have a comment here. Thank you. Uh, uh, just through you, I, I guess. I don't have an issue with the staff report uh, if that's another council, but I think we need to understand what it is that the staff report will address. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, I was hoping that a staff report would ad address uh, the, um, well, I'm going to call it a secondary plan kind of analysis uh, for the neighborhood that uh, Director Farrar uh, referred to and I've been describing. Because I think that the four big questions you brought up, I think they've actually answered this evening. You would have further questions beyond what they've answered in terms of what their vision in the neighborhood was. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I think I heard uh, on the parks, for example, that there should be a park there. Uh, but I would like to know, and I think you know our community should know, where should this park be? Maybe it would be on part of these lands. We don't know where the best place sitting here tonight should the park be and just because this owner I would respectfully submit has gotten out of the gate first uh, perhaps you know we shouldn't exclude that parcel from considerations of where the park should be um, and if we are going to have high density along that whole block that con concurrently not just on another point on the density is all medium I think we need to understand where should it be. Are we converting all that medium density 
to all chocolate block high density. Is that our is that our vision as a town along six? And if that's the case, or just for example, how does that fit into whether that stormwater pond that Director McDonald has just spoken to as being sized to accommodate phase two? Is it still sized to accommodate phase two if we have all that high density? So I just come back and say what I'm looking for uh, is a staff report that would show a concept for the land use in that neighborhood. Um, maybe that's maybe that's what I'm asking for. Uh, through you, if you're if you're looking for a secondary plan exercise, it's going to take much longer than six months, and I don't think it would be fair to come back with a concept plan for that for that entire area without doing some amount of public consultation or public input. Um, so if, if, you, if we truly want a secondary plan, it is not going to take six months, it's going to take much longer than six months. I uh, defer to what you think may, might be a reasonable time frame. This is a significant piece of land and we are talking about changing, as I, as I hear the discussion tonight, the designation of the entire neighbourhood. Because there's no parks currently, there's no high density currently. If it is, would you consider, through you, Madam Chair, uh, should we be asking it to come back within a year? Through you, through you I, mean, I guess it, uh, again, it comes back to what it is if we're trying to respond to staff, have provided response to the issue of parkland dedication. They've responded to the issue of high density and where it should occur. And they've responded to stormwater as well as issue of uh, uh, transportation planning. Um, if uh, there is a requirement that we go back and look at the entire concept plan, that is going to take a significant amount of time and resources to do that. And um, it would be difficult to accomplish that in six months. I have another question then for you, Madam Chair. Um, would it be more appropriate to defer this to consideration through our upcoming official plan review process? I'll leave it up to you to make the motion as to which, where you, whether you want to refer it to that process or whether you wish to defer. Well then, <laughs> uh, I think what I, uh, having heard uh, through you, Madam Chair, the comments uh, from our CAO amen uh, that this could be a lengthy process um, and then given that we're talking about redesignation of, of a large area I, I would therefore ask that my motion be amended uh, and it be deferred uh, for consideration during our upcoming official plan review process okay so I'll ask I had a seconder for that Actually. All right, so I think you would just simply withdraw the first one um, and I'll um, uh, ask you just to, if you both agree to withdraw it and then just restate that you wish to refer it to the other process. Thank you. That's, that's a good uh, suggestion. And you still would second that? Okay. I'll second to keep it on the table. Okay, so um, we'll vote on the uh, motion to refer both uh, uh, items to the um, official plan process. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just a point of clarification. What kind of through you, maybe to the uh, director or to the uh, CAO? What's the timeline that we're looking at? Extensive. The uh, through you, the, the timeline for the OP um, hasn't been determined. So. Sorry, I mean, is that is it something that we're going to be reviewing within the length of this council, or is this something beyond this term? I think it's this term. Yeah, I anticipate it will happen this term, but yeah. it's up to council to decide the timing and, and, and resources. As to time only. I just, I wanted to elaborate. 
No, I'm not speaking. To okay. All right. So I'm going to call the vote. I think we've had enough discussion on this on the uh, motion to refer the items to the official plan process. All those in favor? Those opposed? And that is defeated. Okay. All right. So we still have the uh, recommendation on the floor. Is there any other comments with respect to this? Councillor Gordon? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I have a number of comments. And um, I, uh, I appreciate very much uh, Councillor Hamlin's comments in principle, um, in particular uh, in regard to um, a, a plan that should be within a secondary plan where we don't necessarily have an, an over, overarching strategy for a secondary plan development. Um, but I, on the other hand, uh, don't necessarily want to uh, be um, deferring such a plan forever. Um, but I do have some concerns uh, in regard to this proposal as it sits right now. Uh, one of them we have alluded to is the cash and move parkland. I'm, I'm fundamentally opposed to cash and move parkland in residential, absolutely. Um, now, if I could see phase two and be assured that there was a park planned in phase two, then that would give me more comfort in approving that portion of the plan because I can see that there is a that it will be contributing to a park that will be very close to this neighborhood. Otherwise we're looking at a park that is some sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking if if we could have the uh, planner come up and respond to that comment. Sure. Chair, um, through you. Um, firstly, that the, the property is already designated residential, and this area has been considered through the official plan process for residential development. In the two-year time frame that we were working through the design of this um, this subdivision prior to submission, we had meetings with uh, the planning department, the recreational department, and the way that the plan was um, established was to continue with access from our development to the future lands, as well as into the Creekside development. And the discussion related to the parkland dedication, that they wanted um, park, cash and move parkland in order to utilize that money to, lar to build a larger, bigger park on the adjacent parcel on phase three. Um, I know uh, from experience on many developments within the, the region and both counties, uh, Gray and Simcoe, they don't like to see a lot of small green spaces that are hard to manage and nobody utilizes because they're not big enough to do anything on them. And so the discussion did evolve around that it was better situated in the second phase and it could be adjacent to the stormwater management pond, which would even give it a larger sort of presence in the community. And so we moved forward based on that, that discussion. Um, so I just wanted to articulate that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. So, and and I appreciate that, and I know that that has been discussed. It's just it would be easier to make a decision like I want to make by having something in front of me to see. Um, my second concern is the density, uh, and in particular the density of the uh, lands that abut the backyards of Chamberlain Crescent. Um, because we are looking at very low density single family dwellings backing on to higher end of medium density townhomes. Uh, and it certainly does not allow for an easy integration or transition between those two neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm just, and through you perhaps to the planner, I'm wondering if there is. Uh, some other um, uh, action or plan that could be implemented as an example rather than townhomes, perhaps uh, single family dwellings potentially on smaller lots 
or even duplexes so that there is an easier transition between the densities and it would also have the overall effect of reducing the overall density of this application. Madam Chair. Um, Nancy, could you pull up the, um, the plan that shows the back units and the setback? Oh, thank you. That one. Um, first of all, in regards to the unit type and the transition, we did take that into consideration. And under the current zoning provisions, the required setback is 7.5 meters. Uh, we are proposing a 13.2 to 13.4 meter setback, which is uh, a fairly significant setback in regards to uh, the zoning provisions. Um, we also wanted to articulate that the finished floor elevation would be approximately the same as the, the houses in it behind, so in terms of massing and sizing would be uh, a fit. Um, also the, the townhouses are located to the north of the houses, so shadowing would not be an issue in this particular situation. So we did take those items into consideration. Um, there will be a fence along the back of the property, but we, we did take that into consideration when we designed the property with that additional setback. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, perhaps just one more point, and then, um, Kristen, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the there's about uh, two hectares of this property that is going to be continue to be medium density. Correct, yes, I meant to mention that. And so. um, the minimum uh, density on medium density is 20 units per hectare. So at 42 units on two hectares, you're one or two units above the minimum density in medium density. They were 21, yes. So we're at 21 units per hectare and the minimum is 20. So I just want to make the point that we're not at the higher end of medium, we're at the very bottom end of medium. All right, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Doherty, before I ask if there are any others? Yes, thank you. Um, my last concern is the application for the uh, tree cutting at this time. Um, and I understand the reasons why. However, uh, we have a holding, or there will be a holding on this application if approved. Uh, I, I'm, perhaps staff can provide some indication of when the, the age could possibly be lifted. Um, Director McDonald or Director Shirley. Um, thank you, Chair. The provision for uh, an nature holding, uh, we have uh, initiated that because we have a number of draft plans that uh, sit idle for some period of time. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, we have safeguards to ensure that there is water supply at the time when they apply for their plan of subdivision. This is a draft plan. It's not, uh, it's not uh, their formal approval to proceed. They need to go through uh, engineering and uh, complete or, or uh, satisfy all the conditions. And uh, at that point in time, we would then be in a position to remove the H. Uh, provided that there is uh, capacity available. So it's, the, it's up to them in terms of their timing to get things moving and get things moving through in terms of, uh, of um, removing that age. But at this time, uh, if they were to proceed, uh, we, have no, uh, we have no capacity in issues currently, but if we have several hundred applications of, uh, 100 units of applications come before us and we haven't uh, moved forward with our plant expansion, we could be in a position where we do not have available capacity. So it's a, it's a safety mechanism for us to uh, ensure that, um, that uh, we have uh, capacity available at the time that they proceed to plant subdivision. Okay. So there are other milestones to be achieved before they could practically move forward? Uh, certainly they have to uh, through the chair, sorry. Um, they have to uh, fulfill the uh, number of draft plan conditions before they can get approval. And, and 
uh, putting fill on the property or providing uh, engineering designs and there's all kinds of, of uh, milestones that they have to meet. So it, it, it doesn't really matter whether it's a question of lifting the H or any of the other milestones. The fact of the matter is that a uh, request is being made to destroy trees uh, before a, um, uh, a practical, practical start date for this project can be foreseen. Um, I, I consider some of the other developments where we have granted uh, tree cutting permits not prematurely, perhaps at a logical good time to do it, and yet we were delayed as an example on Helen Court. It's been at least five years where that land has been clear cut and nothing happened. Riverside going on 15 years where it was clear cut. It's building out now, but it's been 15 years. Mountain View the same. Pretty River Estates the same. Uh, Red Maple is another example. Well, not necessarily the fault of the developer, but for whatever reason, the land is clear cut and then it sits. And that is uh, directly uh, um, to the disadvantage of the surrounding neighbors. And so I am very strongly opposed to issuing a tree cutting permit until such time as the developer knows that they will be moving ahead in the short term. I, I guess my question would be, first of all, how do you, I need that articulated into either an amendment or a direction to staff. And then secondly, I need an understanding how it works into the timing, because if they need eight months compression time, compacting time, how do you integrate that into the timing of the tree cutting aligning to allow the compaction when we know it has to happen before in April? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I appreciate that. Okay. All right, so I need you to tell me what it is you want uh, to do. I could suggest that the uh, the recommend the staff recommendation uh, might proceed um, as as tabled, with the exception that the tree cutting permit not be granted until some future time, uh, some uh, other trigger that we could use as a um, uh, a logical point to say now is now is a good time to destroy trees. Sorry, I'm not expressing that very well, but I, I just, I guess my question through to Director McDonald would be, is that crystal balling or is it a, uh, um, some kind of mechanism you could come up with there? It's, uh, through the chair, uh, uh, it is a difficult, uh, there's a, a number of moving pieces here and it's a very difficult uh, thing to predict, you know, will this be in place at that time or will that be in place at that time? It, it is a difficult thing in terms of, uh, you know, some of the, the um, examples raised, you know, some of the developments move forward with every good intention, uh, but uh, they found uh, poor soils, other things that have caused delays, and you don't know that until you move forward with your intentions. It's difficult. Okay. All right. Sorry, no one too late. Um, through you to uh, the director, uh, could specific uh, securities or holdbacks be put in place? Uh, I'm just looking at Google Earth here, specific to the perimeter of the homes that back on from Chamberlain, so that if a period of time lapses, nothing progresses, the, the tree, or tree permit has been put in place, the clear cutting has been done, that there would be securities that are held by the deed municipality that could at least uh, reforest or with tree planting on a perimeter basis? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through you to Deputy Mayor Hall. Um, 
as far as, um, and I'm just thinking of one thing that we did in, in one location, and I'm not sure whether it would be applicable in this location, but there was uh, one development that I can think of where we actually left a small strip of trees at the back of the property, um, at least in the interim until um, they were further along and ready to proceed. Uh, so at least in the in the short term, uh, there were some trees that were left at the back to uh, sort of soften the views for the neighbors. And then when the development was really ready to get going, then those trees came down at a later date. Uh, but that did at least um, keep some kind of a, a, a buffer in place, uh, at least for in the interim. And I don't believe, and I I'm, I'm stand to be corrected, but I don't believe that right at the back of the property there needs to be fill. The fill's going on more of the, uh, well, or at least on the back, let's say three to six meters of the property, there's fill that's going at this point in time. Um, I believe the fill has to go on the front of the property, and uh, therefore that, that might um, provide some comfort to the neighbors, for at least in the interim. Uh, thank you, Director Ferrer, and, and specific to that, I do believe we have a, a situation on Mountain Road where we actually asked the developer to put securities on, uh, allow the money to go both ways in terms of they were going to do the clearing, but um, the nature of their business, the licensing was precarious, so they did agree to allow it to be also be used for landscaping. So I do believe we have that, uh, have had that situation, correct? correct. Yes. Okay. Mayor Saunderson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to pick up on that point, uh, and I, I do have a couple of comments about this uh, situation, just development generally, because I think we're we're living in an era now where we know that infill development is very difficult and we're trying to prevent problems that we've experienced in the past here, but it's very difficult to tell a developer you can't proceed until the property next to you has a plan and you don't own that property next to you. But I guess my immediate question is this. We have in recent past in the Eden Oak development uh, mandated that the fence go in right away and if there is no change to the elevation of the boundary line then is it not possible to require the fence to go in uh, as a condition precedent to any tree clearing whether or not you continue to keep a buffer uh, there in any event. It seems to me that might be a way to um, put up a, a privacy or division between the lots that might uh, alleviate some of the concerns, and they're very real concerns about the uh, tree removal. Is that a possibility? Certainly, the, uh, that is a possibility. In the case of Eden Oak, we did have uh, grading uh, plans uh, available, so we had a, an understanding of, of the grades along that lot line, and in some cases they required uh, uh, a short wall, and so we would need some uh, level of uh, information before we move forward with a, with a request to install the fence. And just to follow up, if I may, Madam Chair, on a question from uh, Councillor um, Dory, I think, there is a large number of conditions, that, and at least in my term on this council, I have not seen uh, as many conditions as this in past developments. Um, so certainly this is, in my impression, a development that's somewhat unique. Um, at what point in time, uh, like, would these conditions need to be satisfied before they can obtain a tree cutting approval? Thank you, um, through the chair to Mayor Saunderson. Uh, no, the all of the conditions uh, would not normally be satisfied. I mean, some of those conditions are, and there may be some that would we would have to look at, but the vast majority of them would really involve detailed design and entering into a subdivision agreement. And all of that is not going to, uh, or highly unlikely to happen before the trees are cut. Um, so if there might be a few that would, would be cut, that would need to be looked at, uh, but generally speaking, um, the satisfaction, satisfaction of the draft conditions would be happening um, a over the next probably year while they're uh, compacting their soil. That said, there are a number that would need to be satisfied. Are we able to identify those? And I guess what we're looking for here is to put um, whatever preconditions are in place to make sure for the abutting uh, landowners that when they do move forward to get their tree cutting approval, 
they have gone as far forward as they can uh, or reasonably required so we're relatively comfortable that they will be moving forward given that they're going to have an 8 to 12 month period where they're letting the fill settle. So I guess what I'm looking for is some guidance from staff on terms of what preconditions should be put in place, what other um, opportunities are there in terms of securities as the Deputy Mayor mentioned or putting a fence in place given that there are not going to be any grading changes of significance on the boundary line to protect our, our residents along Chamberlain Street. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, through you to uh, Mayor Saunderson. Uh, we could certainly look at the list. Um, I, I'm not sure I can do it for you right on the fly, right. but I can certainly, uh, and Director McDonald and I could have a look at the list, go through it, and uh, determine which ones would need to be satisfied prior to there being any tree cutting and then which could happen at a later date. I don't think there'll be many of them but there's probably a few that we would need to look at. Well that would be appreciated and I guess what I'd be asking is that you take a somewhat expanded view of that. So maybe there are others that might not normally be required that we might in this circumstance uh, look at doing. And I guess to make my higher level comment here, if we get in a helicopter and go up 100 feet we in this community know that we have affordable housing and attainable housing issues. We know about the densification requirements and I am a fan of David Crombie and I believe in the Crombie report that we should have all our planning uh, policies in line so that the left hand and the right hand are working together. It is very difficult um, to establish a complete community that, that can house all of our residents if we're not prepared to look at higher densification numbers which include housing complexes like apartments and like townhomes that are going to be more attainable for our residents. So I think that the, that type of inventory uh, is a good thing for our community moving forward. The integration and implementation of that is another issue which I understand uh, can be problematic. Um, but interspersing and inclusive communities is certainly one of the recommendations of the Crombie Report and of planners moving forward and if you go down even old established streets like Saint, uh, Minnesota Street, you will see large homes and then little war homes. And uh, that type of integration in, in our community, I think, is important. All of this is going to say that I, I, uh, I understand the concerns of our residents, um, and recent experience has shown us that infill developments are very difficult. We are on the, looking at uh, undertaking large planning principle um, or refresh. But during that transition period, I don't think you can just stop development. And it's not fair, I think, to require one developer to wait for another parcel to be finalized when they don't own that parcel, it's beyond their control. So I think we have to work at ways that we can implement and move forward with development on the books, being cognizant of the wrinkles and problems and concerns that the existing neighborhoods may have around that. So I would encourage the staff to come forward or to make recommendations that we can uh, hold forth for the developer to give some comfort to the neighbors surrounding the area that they won't be moving forward until they're quite comfortable that they will and are in a position financially and otherwise to do the work and get it done. Um, those are my comments, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. So in terms of your uh, request of staff, is that information that you would want um, to be seen at council uh, for the council meeting in terms of yes okay and so I would think maybe if you would like to move a recommendation as to specifically what you would like staff to add into the information for council consideration that we should do that right. <clears throat> so I, I, I would imagine that we would pass the recommendation um, with the caveat that uh, staff provide council uh, with uh, a list of the uh, preconditions that they recommend be completed prior to issuing a tree cutting permit as well as looking at uh, additional securities and uh, the installation of the privacy fence uh, that would be done um, at, at, which must be done as part of the tree cutting uh, permit. And the potential of the buffer? At yes, and the potential of the, of the existing tree buffer be left uh, up to a distance of a uh, reasonable, I don't know, three meters or whatever would be uh, staff might recommend along that line. Okay, do I have a seconder for the addition? Councillor Doherty? Any further discussion? We've had enough. 
All those in favor of that addition to the original recommendation? All those in favor? That was carried unanimously. All right, so now we're going to look at the recommendation as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, next up is the second part of that, P2019-12, Proposed Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment, 58596th Street. Is there anyone in the public who would like to have further comment on that? Seeing none, I'll put the recommendation on the floor that the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following recommendation to the next meeting of Council. The recommendation that Council adopt the Official Plan Amendment and an act and pass the zoning bylaw amendment for the 586th Street plan of subdivision. Mayor Saunderson, seconder, Deputy Mayor Hall. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, next up, thank you everybody, that was great. Uh, P2019 08, building bylaw and permit fees. Director Fair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll turn this over to our CEO, Greg Miller. Thank you. Hey, good evening. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, your worship, members of council and committee, and ladies and gentlemen, my name is Greg Miller, I'm the chief building official for the town. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to the staff report entitled Building Bylaw and Permit Fees. Um, I want to touch upon uh, some of the changes um, that we want to implement in a, a new building bylaw, and I just want to briefly go over the enabling authority for council as well under the Building Code Act. The Building Code Act is a legislative framework that governs the construction and demolition of, and change of use of buildings in Ontario. And the Building Code is also legislation under the Building Code Act, uh, which is the more detailed administrative and technical requirements of the Building Code. The, um, within the Building Code Act, under su uh, subsection 3.1, the Council of each municipality is responsible for the enforcement of this act within the municipality. Also, the council of each municipality shall appoint a chief building official and as many inspectors as, as necessary for the enforcement of the act in the building code. Further, uh, subsection 7.1, uh, the council of each municipality may enact bylaws and that's the enabling authority for us to uh, establish a building bylaw within the town, uh, town of Collingwood. Under section 7.1, uh, it allows us to uh, pres prescribe certain items with respect to administration and construction. Um, under the, the Building Code Act, uh, it allows us to prescribe classes of permits under the Building Code Act. Uh, it provides application to be um, accompanied by plans and specifications, and we can also detail of, of what's required with that. It also allows council to require the payment of fees and establish the amount of those fees. It also allows us to establish a refund of fees. Further, it also, the building bylaw also allows us to require a person to provide a notice of inspection. So when they're ready for inspection, they are required to give us notice uh, for us to perform that in inspection. It also allows us to establish uh, parameters for the fencing of construction sites. So those are just some of the, the um, items that we can include in a building bylaw. The current bylaw that we have in place right now, and, and that is what we're operating under, is, is uh, bylaw number 2005-033 as amended. Uh, since 2005, there have been numerous updates and amendments to the, both the Building Code Act and the Ontario Building Code. And what uh, we are recommending is, is to establish a new building bylaw that will capture all those amendments and changes. Uh, speaking of which, the, the current um, the proposed bylaw uh, that staff are recommending uh, that we go to proceed with public comment and so forth. Um, just want to highlight some of those. The, the definitions, you'll see that we've expanded the definitions, we've included new definitions, and uh, we've added these uh, to provide clarification. For example, what's uh, 
What's electronic submission? You know, what's what's the permit holder? Uh, what's the definition of a house? Um, the building code uh, act. Uh, sorry, the Ontario building code uh, changed the definition of a house. They, they removed single dwelling and semi-detached, and they lumped it into one definition of a house. So uh, it's imperative that we align our definitions with with the enabling authority and the building code. Uh, we've also expanded the information required for permit applications. Um, whether it's to construct, demolish, or change the use of a building, uh, whether applicants uh, want to apply for a conditional permit or certified models, we have laid out in great detail what is required to obtain a permit for that type of um, building or change of use or what have you. Uh, so the new bylaw, proposed bylaw, um, would, would provide clarity in that regard. We've also added a, a new schedule within the building bylaw, and that's under the plans and specification. And again, it's a very detailed schedule for all uh, permit types. We list all the plans and specifications in the documents to support a permit application. Uh, again, it's, it's more detailed and it provides uh, certainty and clarity for permit applicants moving forward. And one other item, too, is the ask constructive plans. Uh, we've uh, heard some discussions today about infill development. Uh, one of the proposals that we are looking at, including in the building bylaw, is, is requiring a top of foundation wall certification. What that would mean is that when a builder constructs their foundation or constructs their house, uh, before we allow them to proceed with a framing inspection, we would ask that they provide a letter from an Ontario land surveyor or a qualified person that that top of wall foundation, that elevation, is in accordance with what we issued the building permit for and is also in conformance with the overall construction of the, of the subdivision. The reason for that is that we can identify early on in the process of any concerns. Um, so before they proceed to framing, <coughs> perhaps we can add another block to the foundation where we can actually deal with the problem early on instead of uh, further on down the process. Alternative solutions, the building code uh, was amended a, a number of years ago. Uh, it's not so much black and white anymore. Uh, with each sentence within the building code, we have objectives with uh, fire safety, health safety, environmental, and so forth. So each sentence uh, in the building code is attached to objectives and, as well as functional statements. So with all the new technologies and systems coming out, um, it allows us to review those and say, okay, you cannot meet the black and white of the building code. Uh, what, are, what are the objectives you're trying to achieve? And, and, that's the, and that's what's behind the alternative solution. So we want to include that into our uh, building bylaw, be more flexible as possible. Uh, we're also recommending a new schedule of permit fees. Uh, currently, the permit fees are within the town's um, fee and schedule uh, bylaw. Uh, we're, uh, recommending that the new schedule of permit fees be included in the building bylaw. As you can see, it's quite a complex document. It's a, it's a larger document, and it's, it, we feel it's better that it's uh, included within that. Uh, under the permit fees category, we've also included detailed administrative provisions. We've expanded the permit fee types, and uh, we also included a refundable inspection fee. The, uh, the, the, the idea behind the refundable inspection fee and sometimes, you know, on a typical house, it may take, let's say, 10 inspections, and for whatever reason, it may not be ready, um, or the inspection failed. We don't want to start tapping on re inspection fees. So what we're proposing is having a, um, I believe it's a $300 refundable inspection fee that allow the builder up to 15 inspections. Anything more than that, then they will not get that re-inspection fee back. Um, so we think that would help with our uh, the number of re-inspections that we have. Uh, we also feel that the, the schedule and, and the way uh, we have presented the bylaw provide clarity on how fees are determined. And we've also added in uh, fees for collective for building code act enforcement. Um, our number one priority, of course, is, is voluntary compliance with uh, achieving the provisions of the building code. We want voluntary compliance. We'll work with applicants to get that. There is, from time to time, a requirement when you have to enforce, and that may be an issue in order to comply, perhaps. Um, so it really shouldn't be up to the people that do voluntary compliance to subsidize the administration of that building code act enforcement, so that's why we included a, a nominal administrative fee to that. 
Uh, again, uh, the new fees are added to capture the day-to-day -day operations uh, and our services provided. At this time, staff are recommending that no permit fee increases are proposed for 2019. Uh, what we would like to do is get the, the building bylaw um, subject to public consultation and, and council ratification, um, implement this. Uh, we will be reviewing our building code program uh, with respect to cost recovery and uh, will we certainly come back to this committee and council and uh, if there are any proposed fees that we feel that be necessary and again that will happen through the public process as well so that's over the next year or so we'll be looking at, the, at those um, further uh, a code of conduct the building code act requires council to establish uh, and, and enforce a code of conduct for the code of conduct for the chief building official and inspectors and again, that is to promote appropriate standards of behavior and enforcement action by both uh, the chief building official and, and the building inspectors in exercising their powers and you know, performing their duties. It also prevents practices which may constitute an abuse of power or unethical or illegal practices. And also the code of conduct is promote, uh, promote appropriate standards of honesty and integrity in exercising the performance of their duties. So that is implemented as a new schedule within the proposed bylaw as well. And uh, with that, we believe that the proposed bylaw will certainly uh, provide consistency, uh, clarity, and certainty. Uh, this is certainly some uh, themes that we've heard in discussing with builders and homeowners and, and developers. We also believe that it will be an objective of fair administration and enforcement of the Building Code Act and the Building Code. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. You. Uh, before I let you sit down, I'll just is there anyone in the public uh, in the gallery here who wishes to speak to this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, um, CBO Miller, I'll just put the recommendation on the table quickly here, and then if uh, the committee members have any questions, they can ask uh, that the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following recommendation to the next meeting of council recommendation. The council received staff report P2019-08 entitled Building Bylaw and Permit Fees and the council direct the town clerk to provide notice of a public meeting in accordance with subsection seven, uh, six of the Building Code Act to receive input on the proposed changes to the permit fees and adjustments recommended in this report. I'll move her to seconder, please. Councillor Hamlet, Councillor Doherty, and questions through to the Chief Lane. I just have one question. Um, from time to time in our community, we've had problems where people have gotten permission to demolish a property before they have a permit to build. And so we've been left with a few gaping, you know, lots. Is there anything in this bylaw that addresses that? Uh, thank you, Senior Madam Chair. Uh, Absolutely, if, if we come across that an individual has demolished a, a dwelling, for example, without the benefit of a building permit or a demolition permit, uh, then we do have uh, measures on the Building Code Act to uh, issue an order to comply. Um, and also, we can go in and, and rectify that property. Uh, we also have provisions on the property standard bylaw that we can do that as well. Uh, for you, Madam Chair, just one follow-up question. Um, do you require uh, or does our town require that a building permit be in hand before a demolition permit be issued? Well, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. It, it's, it's not a requirement under the Building Code Act. However, we certainly encourage that at least we have zoning bylaw review in place um, for that new project before they demolish it. Um, we want to make sure that they don't get too far down the road and, well, you've already approved my building permit, now I can't demolish it. So we we do encourage that as a standard practice. It's not a requirement in the black and white of the Building Code Act, but it is our standard practice to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Saunderson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Through to you, uh, to Greg. Uh, Greg, great report. Congratulations on that. Uh, I was uh, pleased to read about the electronic services going to the e-permits. And um, how far along do you think you are in that process before you'll be completely paperless? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Your Worship. Um, I was going to present this later on, but I'll, I'll cover it now if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. We're quite excited about this. We've implemented e-permits in September 2018. And uh, so we're, right now we're reviewing all of our building permit applications electronically. 
using a, a program called Bluebeam. And I, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's like an Adobe program uh, on, on steroids, for lack of a better term. It's a very powerful program. Um, so we, uh, we allow permit applicants to submit uh, their drawings um, on our website. You can go into our website, you can click and drag your permit application forms and the permit drawings, they can do that on our website. Um, we have a program called ShareFile, and it's just basically a high secure system that communicates to us in the office. We download those drawings and that's where we start the process. Um, so the building inspectors are reviewing these drawings electronically. Uh, they go into the planning, where there's a planning technician also reviews that electronically, and also understanding engineering services is, is reviewing their overall site plan as well. Um, so that we started that in September 2018. We did a soft launch, and we were gradually getting more and more people on um, submitting uh, their, their drawings electronically to us. There will be. We're still working with uh, you know the homeowners and so forth, the one-off contractors that. Uh, don't feel comfortable with that, so we're going to work with them. Uh, they come into our office, we'll certainly scan the drawings for them, we can certainly help them through the process. Uh, the next phase where we want to take this, and uh, I believe that we're truly the leaders in Ontario because I only know of 20 municipalities out of 444 uh, that have implemented e permits. Uh, the next phase we want to do is we have a program called CityView that's just our permit database system. Uh, we, we have the opportunity to uh, really allow the applicants to enter their application online and have a look and feel of, of that online. So there's going to be some more online uh, provisions with that. So no, it's, it's, um, we're quite excited about that. And um, we, uh, there's tremendous efficiencies being found with electronic permits. You know, reduce the number of trips for a customer in the office. They can submit building permit applications 24-7 to us. And uh, we don't lose files. And uh, we're, we uh, reduced our, uh, our space for, for storing those files as well. So, um, anyways, yeah, thank you. Oh, question if I may. Does the electronic system have a, like a bring forward, will it trigger uh, to make sure that inspections have been done at the appropriate time? Does it prompt you on that? Uh, thank you, Three Madam Chair. Uh, Your Worship, uh, we, we have a separate program called City View. So, this electronic review is completely separate. It's just we, we, we add our notes on to the PDF drawings, if you will, and that becomes the, the actual construction drawing. We have a separate program called City View uh, that we enter an application and then we have our, our activities, our plan review activities and our inspections. And it's a fairly powerful program because you can actually do that. You can actually, if we had a, an active permit for six months, we can go in and we can actually put a, a date in there and that will pop up on our inspector to-do list. You know, say, hey, let's follow up on this. We haven't had an activity for six months. Uh, so there's, there's various things that we can, we can certainly do with that. Great. Thank you very much, Ray. Okay. That's great. All right. So if there's no other questions, then I'll ask for the vote on the recommendation. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. And uh, Greg, before you leave, I think if the committee is okay with it, why don't we just move to your departmental update? And, sure. Uh, anybody, anybody okay with that? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to give an update. Um, in, in your package this evening, I, I provided a memo with the building permit stacks and so forth. And I was asked to provide a, a presentation, um, an update on, on where we are within the Ontario Building Program. The first slide I have here is what we do, but I think it's better that we um, identify who we are. Um, my name is Greg Miller, and I'm the CEO of, of the building department. I also have a, a small but high performing team. Uh, my deputy chief building official is uh, Brian Bell, um, building inspector Corey Effinghouse, uh, Leah Hugo, who we hired in um, July of last year, is also a building inspector, and of course, uh, Lynn Gowan, who is our building assistant. So we have a small group, but we're a high performing group. Uh, what we do is we administer the building code and we enforce the building code act on behalf of council, on behalf of council, and um, we are very vital to protecting the health and safety of the public, whether it is a, uh, residential buildings, commercial, industrial buildings, or um, agricultural buildings. Uh, we are we ensure that the, the building conforms with the minimum requirements of the building code throughout the construction process. Um, we provide comfort to the public when they uh, enter or occupy a building that a building official has gone through and made sure that the minimum life safety requirements 
of that building has been met. Under the Building Code Act, uh, we are uh, required, uh, the number of tasks that we are required to do in the Building Code Act is administration, so we review plans, uh, new construction and renovations uh, for all building types uh, to ensure that uh, there is compliance with the applicable building standards. Um, there's several building standards, not just building code, but there's um, Canadian safety uh, CSA standards, uh, there's NFPA standards, National Fire Protection Standards, for fire alarm sprinkler systems, so we, we go through to make sure that building conforms with those applicable standards. Uh, as I mentioned before in, my, in previous uh, presentation, we, we do uh, enforce the Building Code Act. Uh, we make sure that the construction follows the approved plans. It, it is also in compliance with the Building Code uh, throughout the building process. As I mentioned before, volunteer compliance is our ultimate goal. Uh, we'll work with builders, homeowners, etc. to get through the complex process and administration of the Building Code. Uh, but from time to time, we do have to enforce the Building Code Act. We also are an educator. Uh, we are the experts in the field. We are the ones with specialized knowledge with the Building Code and the Building Code Act. We find the province is becoming less of a resource, and that puts more emphasis on us to, to educate uh, people on that. We're also the industry driver. Uh, construction is a driver of construction and growth, and so we want to make sure that our approval processes are transparent and streamlined as much as possible. Uh, in addition to the building code uh, um, obligations we have, we also administer the sign bylaw, the swimming pool fence bylaw, and the heritage conservation um, bylaw. So we do inspections on the heritage conservation program as well. So this is just a bit of what we do. I know it's a very small snapshot of what we do, but uh, we do a lot more than that. But um, in the package that I mentioned, there was a 2018 uh, or January stats update. I just want to give a bit of numbers too with um, what we did in 2018. Uh, in 2018 we issued 753 building permits. That's down slightly from um, 770 in, in 2017. Uh, the estimated construction value was 70.4 million. That's down 31 percent from, from that of 2017. In uh, 2018 we issued 164 dwellings versus uh, 293, which is down about 44% from, from last year. Uh, this chart here, um, hopefully you can see it, it just provides a three-year um, overview of the permits that we've issued. And, and we also use a three-year average. Uh, so what I've done here is combined um, in this table building permits. As you can see, we're hovering around 760 building permits issued per year. And I have another slide that I'll show you that we're actually projecting a bit more than that in 2019. Um, so the rest of them, compliance letters, uh, heritage tax relief applications, pool closures, um, it's fairly consistent on a year-over-year -year basis. We issue about 325 non-OBC permits. Uh, but you see the three-year average for building permits is, is 76, 761. The, the the, uh, the graph I have here is the building permits issued. It gives you a 10-year snapshot of the building permits that we've issued. Um, the, uh, the graph shown in green, you'll see from 2009 to 2015, the number of building permits remain relatively flat or consistent. Um, I think around 550 building permits were issued during that time from 2009 to 2015. You notice a significant increase from 2015 to 2016. There was over a 40% increase on the number of building permits that we issued. And again, that seems to be our norm. It's in around 750 building permits. And you'll see in 2019, we're actually projecting another significant increase in building permits. And that's due to the Indigo Estate site. Uh, they have 160 uh, permits in the first phase that we're looking at issuing in, in a fairly short time. Uh, and across the way, we have the, uh, the Devon Lee site really coming on board as well. Uh, with that, we'll, you'll see there's a, what I call a staff to permit ratio. Um, we're issuing in the neighborhood around 1,400 uh, permits per staff right now, and that's slightly increasing now. So uh, that's just the <coughs> workload that we have. We need to keep, keep an eye on that. Uh, this is next one here. It's, it's, it's difficult to read. I won't go too much detail, but in 2019, we've already issued um, 60 permits, which is considerable higher than, than the three-year average that we've been doing. So, um, 
as any uh, municipality in the province or our busy time is, is from April right to October. So I can make this available online too for, for the public that, that can't see this tonight. Uh, the total annual construction value again is a 10 year snapshot from 2009 to 2018. Um, so we're in the neighborhood just under $80 million per year. You'll see the past three years, 2016 to 2018, we're just slightly above that. And we, we don't see that increasing too much higher. Uh, 2019 might be a bit of fluctuation, but um, it gives us a good snapshot of, of the history of that. Um, further analysis, that's three quarters of our permit activities in the residential sector. So um, <clears throat> that's a fairly large sector for us. In 2018, uh, we completed 3,680 inspections. Uh, that was up from 7% in 2017. And um, I also keep track of the accumulated number of inspections we complete over 12 months. So at the end of January, we completed over 3,800 inspections. That's a, that's a record high. And for a small building department, that's, that's quite a bit. Uh, not only are they doing building inspections, they're also doing the plan reviews. So we're estimating around 14 to 1,500 inspections per inspector. Um, this provides a five-year snapshot. I won't go into too much detail, but you'll see that uh, again in 2016, between 2016 and 17, it took a significant, a significant increase. Um, that red line is the inspections per inspector. Um, I should note that we hired a new building inspector in 2018, so that's why that red line is is gone slightly because the more inspectors we have, the uh, the less inspections uh, per inspector that, that we have. Um, some of the service delivery enhancements I, I, I just briefly talked about, the, the e-services, uh, e-permitting, uh, consistency, clarity, and, and certainty is certainly one of the themes that we are working on and striving for. We want to improve our customer service uh, the best there to our ability. We are always looking at ways to do, do things better. Um, again, we want better applications. We want to get things, uh, help people get things right the first time. So in doing that, we've, um, we've implemented new per uh, building permit guides and checklists that kind of gives you what, uh, what I need to do to obtain a permit, it outlines all in detail, uh, the required documents, approvals, and permit fees. Uh, we've created an accessory apartment guide. Uh, the building code can be very complex. We're trying to put it in <coughs> as much plain English as, as we can. It's difficult at times to do that because it is very technical in nature. Uh, we, all, we also have a standard a deck details that uh, we are working on. Um, so if a homeowner wants to come to us and they have, a, let's say, a straightforward 10 by 20 deck they want to build, uh, they can use our standard details. They won't require drawings. Um, as long as they build, build to that, we'll do a quick zoning review, make sure it conforms to the zoning bylaw, and then we can issue the building permit. Uh, we also are working on a, a, a similar nature for a detached garage where we have a floating slab that's stamped by a P-Eng, and um, they can use that to build their garage as well. So that will certainly streamline our permit application to get them out the door a lot quicker. Um, email notifications, um, again, uh, certainty and clarity. We, we provide the applicant with email notifications as soon as they, we receive the permit application. We enter it into our system, we give them a permit number, and we also tell them um, uh, the date that they can expect a, a response from us. And also we do pre-screen our application to identify any red flags with um, early on in the process. We don't want to get two weeks down the process and say, well, we need this approval. So we're going to work with them and pre-screen them as, as much as possible. Uh, E-permits I've already talked about. Um, so I think that is, uh, that is it for my presentation. I'm sure. Very much. Um, okay. Are there any questions? I think it was pretty thorough. Thank you very much. Oh, Council. Okay. Um, I was amazed by the number of inspections per inspector, <laughs> and I just like, like, do you think there's enough staff? Like, do you, like, is that a normal level for a building department? Because I sort of, you said about fifteen hundred per inspector, and I thought. You know, given the number of business days in a year, they must be doing like seven a day, five a day. Like, I just wanted to see how you felt about that. Exactly, three, Madam Chair. That remains a concern of mine. The workload that we currently have, 
Um, so we are looking at alternative means to deliver our services. Uh, in fact, we are looking at a third party to help us with the plan reviews of building permits. Because of our e-permit system, um, we, we contact, contacted a consultant that uses the same program as us, the, the, the PDF would be. Um, so we'll, how that would work, once we get the application in, we will just send the drawings down to this consultant. It obviously charges a fee for that, but they're the ones that will um, discuss with the applicant. They're the ones that do the plan review for us. So that will take off some of the workload uh, of our inspectors. Uh, but that is something that uh, I am monitoring. Um, it is a very high workload for a, for a municipality of this size and the volume that we're putting out. Thank you. Mayor Saunderson? Yes, thank you to you, Madam Chair. Greg, I'm just looking at the, the quick stats for January and it says we've increased our number of permits by 107%, yet our building permit revenue fell by uh, about 31%. Can you just explain how that works? Yes, absolutely to you, Madam Chair. Uh, typically, uh, I'd have to look at the specifics on this one, but the revenue that we receive may not be the same month that we issue the building permit. So, um, so some permits uh, we may receive full building permit fees when they submit the permit application. Uh, so that's why there might be an influx. I, I'm pretty sure that's that's why in this instance. All right. Thank you. Okay. And just I guess the only comment I would make in terms of <coughs> Councillor Hammond's request. Um, you are self-funded, so any of those increases would come within the building permit structure revenue as opposed to the tax base. Okay. All right. If there's no other questions, then thank you very much for being here and thank you, thank for your report. You. All right. So last up is uh, reports, minutes of other committees and boards. Uh, we have the Collingwood Heritage Committee minutes from November 21st, 2018 and January 23rd, 2019. I don't see that there's anybody here to comment unless media and Councillor Berman would like to have a comment. <laughs> All right, so uh, that the Development uh, and Operations <coughs> Services Standing Committee receive and refer the following minutes to the next meeting of Council, including the following recommendation to be included in the 2019 budget deliberations. Recommendation that Collingwood Heritage Committee is aware of current staff restrictions and time constraints, recommends that a full-time equivalent dedicated staff resource be hired or contracted from the November 21st, 2018 minutes. I have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Doherty, Councillor Hamlin. Any comments? Is the budget process the right place for that request to go or would it be the reorg? Or is that the right place for it to be? The budget is fine. Okay. All right. If there's no other questions, then all those in favor? This is carried unanimously. Thank you. So I don't see that there's anyone who would like to do another public uh, delegation. So there's no other business. Any other business committee members? Seeing none on motion by. Who wants to move it? Councillor Doherty, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you again, everybody, for your participation and your help.